It's really interesting to see your opinion. And I learned a lot about the UFC and the cutting and what was going on and the stories. Really enjoyed hearing that. I was kind of on the edge of my seat listening to you. What kind of questions we want to discuss. It's like, I'm totally good with everything. Yeah, man, me me too. I'm open to everything. Maybe a little bit to to compare the differences between peaking for an MMA competition versus a bodybuilding competition. I'd love to hear more of like what you guys do because there's similarities in, in physique, lean mass ratios and such, but disparities in, in what you must do and then what we must do to perform the next day, right? The main uh, similarities is going to be with powerlifting. I don't think bodybuilding, I think the only thing that would be similar with bodybuilding would be the actual like being in a calorie deficit and dieting. But I think that for MMA, I think it's a lot more similar to powerlifting because in powerlifting, you make a weight class and you can put on 20 pounds. So like, for example, well, we may as well do it during the interview. Like, Yeah, no, I, I agree. We'll get in. Yeah. I have a slightly similar, but slightly different opinion on it. What a great opportunity to just chat on, on sport and on life and on training and all, yeah. the, all the other great stuff. I mean, you and your career, what you've done is is legendary. I mean, who doesn't know your name, your channel, and you're very polarizing, which we just spoke about offline. So, you know, polarizing, but intentionally so in, in the matter that you don't really care what people think you're delivering the information the way you believe is best based upon your you know, uh, knowledge and experience. Yes, but also your desire to help because you did say that. You, you want to put out really good, great content to help people. And there's content that helps people through entertaining them, right? For 10 or 20 minutes or so, which is awesome. But previous to that, to Greg Doucet of, of YouTube fame, you were Canadian born. Just very briefly, like, where, where were you born in Canada? Where did you grow up in Canada? I'd love to briefly hear about that. and Your, your strength experience kind of at leading you to who you are today. Well, I grew up in Yarmouth, Nova Scotia, Canada. It's a small, like, fishing community um, you know, just this really small town. And I was really into sports my whole life. I love sports. I love being good at sports, but unfortunately I wasn't that good at them. And so I tried every single sport out, basketball, soccer, badminton. I tried them all, but I was okay, but not really good. But then I started weightlifting and I was like, wait a minute, I'm stronger than all my friends. Like on day one, stronger than my friends, had bigger muscles. I remember being like a kid and flexing biceps, like as a two-year-old and being like, look at my arms and stuff. And so I was really good at that. And I think what you're good at something, you just want to do more of that, the positive reinforcement. And so I just kept entering events or competing in events that I was good at. And so as I got older, I got out of doing triathlons because I did triathlons for 13 years, but I just wasn't that good. I was good, but not like great at it. But bench press contests, I enter a bench press contest at a bar and I'm beating all the grown men as a 16 year old. And I'm like, this is where it's at. Cause I was like, I just love being good at something. I don't care what it was. I think if I was good at piano, I'd play piano, good at chess. I just want to be good at something. And so I gravitate towards anything I'm good at and weightlifting, powerlifting, bodybuilding became what I was best at. How did you get into the cycling, which is polar opposite to the body or the, the powerlifting side, but even the bodybuilding side with the weight, you're also a pretty experienced cyclist. I love competing. And so like I first started lifting weights at 10 and I, I got the muscles and I was stronger than my, I have a twin. I was stronger than him. And I was, my friends was stronger than them. And then I was into sports. I was into competitions and I was trying to find the best one. I was like, I could try out for the basketball team, the soccer team. And I, I was like, yeah, I can play. Like I can kind of be all right. But then there was this thing of cycling and I watched it. I'm like, I want to enter the cycling competition. And so I just borrowed a bike literally and I'm just entering races and I'm like sucking at it. But it was so enjoyable because the more I trained, the more I got better and the, and the more I was doing like in races. So when I first started cycling, I was horrible at it. When I did my first triathlon, I got last place out of 82 riders, 82 people in a triathlon by about 20 minutes. But I loved it to death. I was so fun because it was me against me trying to push the limits, trying to see how good I could get. And the next year, I, I beat one or two people. Then the year after I kept getting better. Eventually I won the junior provincial championships. Yeah. And as a senior, I was like fourth place. So I was good, but I was training like 20 hours a week. I was putting in all the time in the world. And I was like, I'll never be at a national level provincials. I could maybe get like top three or four. You know what I mean? And that's yeah. a 20 hours a week. And at the same time I was doing 
weightlifting. I was trying to be a bodybuilder. I was competing in bodybuilding and doing triathlons at the same time. And so my muscles were getting bigger, but not at a fast rate because I was doing 20 hours of cardio and lifting weights. So it's hard to do both. Yeah. Eventually I said, I'm way better at bodybuilding, way better at powerlifting. I'm going to stop the triathlons. And I stopped that and kept bike riding out of the three events, the swimming, the running and the cycling. I was best at, at bike riding and running really shrinks your legs. It was very difficult and swimming. It was hard on the shoulders. So I kept biking for a bit. And then eventually I'm like, I'm all in and bodybuilding. I gave up cycling completely, stopped doing cardio, thinking I'm going to get more muscle, became an IPV pro bodybuilder. Then four years ago, I'm like, man, I'm not healthy. Get off the drugs and start doing cardio and becoming fit again. And, it's, I, and it was a long uh, battle ahead, like 15 minute bike ride. I was like, holy, I'm winded. Now I feel great. I have so much more cardio. My muscles are a bit smaller, but I mean, I'm only on HRT. So with the, with the doses that I'm on to have even any muscle with this much cardio, I think, I think I'm doing amazing. So I'm really happy with, with where I'm at. Aside from having two broken elbows where I had my triceps reattached on both of these. So you can see my, my left triceps is really small. This one kind of grew back. This one's tiny. I have no strength on this side. Yeah. So I'm fighting it. I'm doing the best I can in the gym, but I, I enjoy everything. Now, you said a moment ago that you hit a point four years ago that you just didn't feel healthy. What was the trigger? What was the catalyst to that thought, if you remember, in that time? Just walking around and being like, let's go for a walk with the dogs and being like, I'm tired. And I'm and looking back to being a triathlete and being like, man, I used to be the fit guy, like the fittest guy that anyone knew. Like if you asked anyone in my town where I grew up, like name the healthiest guy that you know, they would have said my name. And then all of a sudden I'm like on steroids and I'm like bigger, not that I'm fat, but like heavier, sluggish. And I'm doing my 15 minute warm up cardio and being like, man. I'm taught like, this is not good. And I bulked up on purpose to try to break the world record in the bench press. I got as fat as I like, humanly could get. I was 230 something pounds and, 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 and that's 40 pounds heavier than I am now, just to give you an idea. And I just didn't feel fit. And so there was no, like, wasn't like blood work that was horrible, even though I, I was on steroids, abusing steroids, my blood work was still pretty good considering everything. As soon as I stopped my cycle at the end of it, after a show, it would all return to normal. So I felt like pretty healthy. So it wasn't that it was just a matter of like going to play volleyball and going to play basketball and just shooting around and not being able to dribble a ball behind my back, you know, just like simple stuff. And I'm like, it's just, I had enough. I, I got to get back in shape. Yeah. Wow. That's uh, a lot of guys run right through that feeling. They embrace it, accept it. And that's who they become. They become these more sedentary folks that can lift barbells for an hour or so per day, but are pretty useless in between meals thereafter. Right. Oh, absolutely. Now, commonly, well, in the, the common era, we're seeing a lot of bodybuilder health issues, bodybuilder deaths. You're an IFBB professional bodybuilder. You know bodybuilder. You train with him. You've been backstage with him. What are your thoughts on the most common probable causes of this massive influx, it seems, of health conditions in the, and it's the certainly, upper ranks? Yeah, it's been really scary. And that's been another reason why I've said I'm not going to do any more steroid cycles because I hadn't in my mind given up on that. I'm like, well, because the last show I did, I did men's classic physique. So that's from an open bodybuilder where you're like as big as possible to this has weight classes. So I had to make 185. So I'm like, my cycle was next to nothing. It was like a quarter, maybe a third at best of what I would have done in the past. So it was not that big a deal. And so I thought maybe I'll do it again. But after all these guys are dying of heart attacks, I'm like, well, I'm not going to do that again. And so really the biggest problem I think is the heart. I think that people are getting heart attacks because when you're on steroids, you're going to have higher blood pressure. Your cholesterol is going to be out of whack. Your HDL, the good cholesterol goes down, the, the LDL up. And so not healthy. And so I think that's the biggest problem. I don't think like liver and stuff like that's a problem too, but not as much. So for, for me, for the most part, I think it's having high blood pressure and your cholesterol being out of whack. I think that's the worst part of actually taking steroids. Yeah. And then the, the food consumption, as you said, the open class is there's no limits. And in fact, you're encouraged to be the biggest version of yourself, right? And the biggest, big, big Ramy, right? He's the reigning Mr. Olympia because he's the biggest guy on stage in many ways, not the prettiest, not the best built body, from my perspective, right? I like a little more of an aesthetic blend to it. Um, but with deep appreciation mentally of what you guys go through 
And the bigger guys. So Antoine Viant just came back. He just came back out of the blue after less than a year ago talking about he had cataclysmic cardiovascular disease building. He what, a 98% blockage? 99 of- percentile plus. So one in 100 people were as bad as him. And I'm like thinking, how could he be competing? Because he's clearly not natural now i no. mean he walked into that show he only got beat by ian by ian Belair by one point and in the evening three points so he didn't get smoked he was second place almost as good as ian ian yeah. still beat him but like to go through that and still do that cycle to me that tells me that mentally he's not ready to call it quits i think that he identifies with what would have been that amazing freakish body that he would have had as a 15 year old. I remember competing at nationals with him, not against him, but with him, he's a junior and I'm seeing him and I'm like, that guy is 25, 30 pounds bigger than me. And I'm in my thirties. I'm like, how is this even possible? So he just would have just seen his physique as just, that's, that's how he identifies that. And I don't think he's ready to hang it up, but I think that he should not because he's done. Like clearly he looks amazing, but I think that, Health wise, there's no way you can convince me that taking steroids is is safe or healthy. I mean, I did it. I abused it for 10 years. But like even myself and I haven't had those warnings from the doctor saying, you know, you're at the 99 percent that like I just don't see how you could keep going. It To me, that's like somebody that's been addicted to something and just can't stop of which he has had addictive issues in the past. Yeah, it seems to me like a bit of a death wish. There, we know exactly what this end result will be. And you can talk about someone recently, I, I forget who one of the podcasters had discussed like, oh, well, he's doing it as healthy as possible. It's like you're playing Russian roulette with four chambers full saying, well, I'm playing as, as healthy as possible. Like he might sneak through this show and maybe next show, but he did so well in this show, he'll probably push it in his next show, maybe just add a couple things back that were on the fringe, but this time was okay. So I add a little bit more. So there's that kind of um, risk creep that comes in, especially high level performers, right? He's on the stage, right? So he's in that 1% of the, the, the human population and even smaller percentage of that probably. But man, it's terrifying as me to sit here and watch knowing what I know, working in the health and fitness field, understanding what the risks are of the lifestyle. And I see a guy like that come out. And do you have any thoughts on how that reflects to all of the 15 to 25 year olds watching right now? And this is something I think about often is the imitation factor. Guys like Antoine, and I know a lot of people they idolized Antoine in the very early days of YouTube because he was one of the first creators out there putting hardcore content, right? So he has a big following. Even guys his own age looked up to him in many ways were inspired. So he's an inspirational guy, but also I, I think maybe it's systemic in the bodybuilding culture where that bigger, better, push it harder mentality is rewarded and gratified, though it is a, a, a suicide's journey. To be fair, like there's no health benefit to this. Yeah, I mean, I see it as no difference than like the rich piano, like, you know, the yeah, the, yeah. the you go all in at all costs. You have to win. And it's like that mentality that the more you push, the more you're rewarded. And and what a comeback story it is. And, you know, he was addicted in the past. He, he came battle addiction and it's like he's a champion. He's overcome this. and He's such a likable guy. And you've seen him go through all this. But at the same time, he's he's addicted, in my opinion, to bodybuilding. And bodybuilding is not a healthy sport. And we always preach, get your blood work done, get your blood work done. The problem is people don't want to get their blood work done because what if what I'm what if I'm told that I'm not healthy. And so I've coached even people and I'm like, you need to get your blood work. I don't want to get my blood work done because when they get the blood work back, they don't want to make the changes. And I've had people hire, like they've hired me and they're taking 1400 milligrams of trend and they're showing me their blood work. And I'm like, I I can't believe what I'm seeing here. I'm like, you need to go off. And they're like, well, I hired you to get me bigger. And I'm like, "But, but you need to come off. Like, I just, I don't know what to tell you. Like, like, what am I supposed to say right now? You are ready to die. And I, I don't know how to help you, but they just want, they just, there's no end to it. And they get into their forties and fifties and they can't stop. It's like, 
all good things have to come to an end. Just like when you're partying and, and it's 5 a.m., it, the, the party has to end eventually. You can't just keep going for days and days and end, although some do, and that's when the drug addictions happen. And it's like, it, you have to stop. And so eventually bodybuilding has to stop. I chose to stop, you know, already. I could have kept going, but you look at these other guys that are doing it in their 40s and they're getting heart attacks and they're dying. And and Antoine, that's a scary it's a scary situation, in my opinion, because what if he gets a heart attack in the next year? And then people are going to look back and say, well, geez, if he hadn't have done that show, he'd be with us for another 20 years. Yeah. Wasn't that what was the consensus about Cedric McMillan? Exactly. He, he couldn't serious- quit. Yeah, he, he just couldn't quit bodybuilding. Like, he just had to do it, whether it was for his sponsors or because it was for him. Um, he, he, and then he, and he passed away and it's like, if he would have stopped, I do believe he would have continued. He wouldn't have, it wouldn't have ended it. Yeah. And for those watching and listening, Cedric McMillan, top bodybuilder, Arnold classic winner, right? So very legit physique, top 10 in the world, perennial got sick during the COVID season. Maybe he got it. Maybe I think he did. Like, I'm not too, you know, versed on his, his health issues per se, but I know he was hospitalized multiple times, ton of time in there, severe digestive issues, constant burping, right. For weeks on end, like hospital couldn't fix it. Medicine couldn't fix it. His body was screaming out to him. There's a bunch of stuff going wrong here. And instead of taking the time to truly address it, it appears Cedric rushed his way back into the bodybuilding lifestyle, the eating, the drugs, and the comp- competition prep, which is, I don't know, you can tell us, Greg, getting ready for a competition is drastically more unhealthy than maybe off-season food and, and 500 megs of tests a, a, a week, right? The drugs used to peak for a bodybuilding competition are the most dangerous things you could do in any sport of whatever you're competing in compared to powerlifting or any other sport I'm in, or even in off season bodybuilders. There's nothing like trying to peak for a bodybuilding competition. You're, you're on the biggest cycles you're ever going to do. You're adding in more and more drugs and you're playing with your hormones that much more. You're trying to dry out your estrogen completely. You're getting below 5% body fat, which isn't healthy in the first place. And you're doing so in a calorie deficit while training to the limit so you're doing everything you shouldn't do you're trying to maintain the muscle that you have without eating enough food without resting enough you can't sleep you're on so many drugs the drugs alone prevent you from sleeping not eating so your cortisol through the roof you've been psych you're, you've been on steroids essentially the whole year and it's peaking at this point like the drugs are going up at these at the end and you're taking all the most dangerous ones the orals like halo testing and these different things to harden you up the worst part and that you feel like shit you feel like garbage and when i'm prepping for a show like the last 3 weeks every hour is like torture it's kind of like when you're cutting weight for a show or for a competition like you're the last 2 pounds it's like every second feels like a minute and you're suffering to that extent. It's like three weeks of just absolute torture. And I look back, I'm like, how did I do it? Like, it just, it's shocking that you can put yourself through that much torture when you're, you know, sub 5% body fat, hardly eating, having to go to the gym. It's a nightmare. And doing that, and you're taking drugs to get you to the gym. And then those are making you feel even worse. And all you're thinking is, I can't wait for the drugs to stop. Like you feel horrible. Like when you're off season bodybuilding on say it's 500 milligrams of test, 500 milligrams of EQ or whatever, some Anivar, generally you feel amazing. You go to the gym, you feel great. You're recovering all the time. Your muscles are full. When you're in the last couple of weeks before bodybuilding, it is a nightmare that you can't wait till it's over. And, and every time I watch a guy compete and they do YouTube videos about it, I can relate right away because I can see it in their face, just how you know, struggles are going through. And then after the show's over, they can eat again and how happy they are. And so anyone that's thinking, maybe I want to enter a show, I always say, don't do it unless you're convinced to do it. If you're like on the fence, maybe I feel like competing, then don't do it. It'd be like, hey, I'm thinking about entering a fight. Really, you're not sure if you want to get punched in the face or not. You have to be like, I can't wait to fight, then do it. Because if you're not, you're you're not ready. Yeah, that's true. That's a great analogy. Um, coming out of this now, so you go through the off season, you destroy your body and in, in training and lifestyle, you really grind your way down, which I have so much respect for the mentality. I understand the mentality it takes 
to do that, right? It's a whole nother level. I was talking to uh, Jesse Eitzler, who created Vita Coco and, and, you know, he's married to the lady who just sold Spanx for a billion some odd dollars. <laughs> I was speaking to him a few years ago, right? I mean, just these serial entrepreneurs here, owns a private jet company, is this amazing stuff. I'm speaking to him in the tunnel of the UFC when Robbie Lawler was fighting Carlos Condit. I work with Carlos Condit for that fight. So he just walked out, shh, the crowd's going crazy. I'm standing in the tunnel and Jesse just comes up to me. He's just a really tall dude standing next to me. I can see in his face and his physique, he's an athlete of some sort. Hey, what's up, man? Hey, what's up? You know, what talk, chit chat, this, that, and find out that he's an endurance athlete, extreme endurance athlete, right? You know, he's one of those like hundred miler kind of guys in his spare time and dude's a billionaire but i don't know anything about his background he's just another dude he could be a homeless training partner for all i know that, that got a haircut right so we're, we're talking talking about what he does in the races and i'm like kind of in, in more coach mode listening to the athlete right or just kind of listening i'm just thinking about well lifestyle and how do you eat and how do you train and how do you peak and all this little kind of athlete stuff having condit just walk through the tunnel to go fight robbie for 25 minutes after cutting 25 28 pounds i think we did for that camp right so now i got this other endurance athlete there and as i'm talking there's something different not that carlos condit per se isn't crazy the natural born killer for a reason but Endurance athletes, guys like Jesse in this moment, and, and maybe like yourself and, and many others, we work with Galen Rupp and, and Cameron Haynes and such. Those type of athletes, there's a desire to suffer that many other great athletes don't have. George St. Pierre didn't have that. That's why he got out of this sport. He, he, he loved athleticism and competition and the martial arts lifestyle. He hated violence. He hated the, the me versus you, the anxiety, all that stuff that goes into it. And a lot of the suffering where Guys like Jesse, they do it only for the suffering. They don't care about the miles of the road. They have that, that's just the means to the end. It's that putting themselves in that time where they can suffer for hours on end. And that's a whole nother beast that, that stands right there. And there's something to that in the bodybuilding world, but it's so far skewed with the negative outcome. And so it's like, I deeply respect the mentality of bodybuilders who can go that deep. Cause I understand how deep that is to go that deep into a prep. There's this, this extra thing that you have, or maybe that you lack, you know, we could get Jordan Peterson out here and, and have that conversation. You have any thoughts on that? The mentality behind this? Well, actually, uh, yeah, you hit the nail on the head. Like it's a hundred percent true. And do, going through sports my whole life, I found that other people, when I compared myself to them is they don't want to train hard. They don't want to suffer that hard. They never, it, I was like, why don't they? Like when I would do killers or whatever in, in, in basketball, I would go all out. When I swam in practice, it was all out. And then I'd go into a race and I would get beat by my teammates. And I'd be like, how are you beating me? Every single swim practice, I beat you. And we go to a race and you beat me. Well, I don't go hard in practice. I'm like, what is this? What do you mean you don't go hard? Or bike riding. I would try it up for the Canada Games. I didn't make it. And I beat this guy. Every single day would beat him in, in, in practice. We do the race and he smokes me. It's not even close. And I'm like, how did you go so fast? He's like, well, I don't ride that hard in training. I'm like, never? I'm like, no. I'm like, so I don't understand that. And so I gravitated towards sports that, you had to suffer. I wanted that. Like the triathlons, like it's like you're doing a race for three hours or you're training like 20 hours a week cardio. And it's like, you're pushing yourself. I want to be beat my best times. And so there are not many people that, that like that. And so I think that bodybuilders, they definitely want to suffer. And when you don't, so for example, I tried to bring bodybuilding more to the mainstream. And by in, in doing that, I said, it's not chicken, broccoli, and rice. You don't need to do, I, I did enough suffering with the diet that I had enough of wanting to suffer on the diet. I want to suffer with pushing myself, not with being hungry. So I made a cookbook and the whole thing so that people didn't have to suffer dieting to an extent. And other bodybuilders are like, they're against it. Uh, no, I don't want that. Protein ice cream, you mean I can actually enjoy it? Like, no, it has to be boring. Blend up your chicken breasts. And so I find that most people, they do want to have that suffering and the best athletes, they have to be able to do that at the top level. And the ones that don't like the flex wheelers it looked amazing, but it's like, you couldn't quite diet hard enough. And so when you look at a bodybuilding competition, you're being judged on like how much muscle you have and how lean you are. And genetics predominantly is going to come down to who has the biggest muscles. Like we all going to train hard, but whoever's the leanest, 
you have to suffer. I don't care how great your genetics are to get down to like 4% body fat, you have to suffer. And so when I'm judging a show, I'm like that guy right there, he might have not have a lot of muscle, but that one, that person suffered to get there. And so you really have to respect somebody putting in the work to get there. Cause not everyone can have IFBB pro size muscles, but everyone can get shredded. Yeah. Now does the person that suffers the most get rewarded by the judges more often than maybe their aesthetic physique should move them in the ranks is, does that come into it i think absolutely at this point you, you you look to a bodybuilding competition and it's almost the one who's emaciated that's going to win it's almost a, it's it's obvious at an unhealthy level because how is four percent five percent six percent healthy it's mm -hmm. it's gotten to the point where we're over rewarding needing to be super shredded like and i'm i'm critical like some people ask me for what, what's your advice and i'm looking at their their body and i'm like well, you weren't lean enough they're five and a half percent body fat yeah Jesus. but i'm like if you were four and a half you would have won and so it's like, you're not lean enough, but you're shredded. Like you're just, to anyone's mind, it's like you are disgustingly lean. I'm like, you're not lean enough. And so it, it's hard to say that, but I just know that that I'm just telling the people what they need to hear, not what they want to hear. That's it's, it's so crazy because you understand the difference between 6% and five, five and four, right? It's, it's incredible where the average person they're listening and they're at 20 right now. On average, easily two thirds of the people watching this, two thirds of the people we see at the, the, the grocery store, they are overweight to obese. They are high BMIers. These are people that are closer to 20% plus than they are to 15 plus. Honestly, yeah. like we see them walking around. Even the skinny fat ones, low muscle, they're like, ah, oh, yeah, weigh 170. But shit, bro, your 20% body fat at 170 is not a good look, nor is it healthy. Um, so we, we have these people, these different body fat percentages, but to go from four to three, well, that's 25% of the fat on your body you have to lose. And that puts it in perspective, especially because now we can see all the tendons, right? At 5%, at, at, at 6%, you can see the tendons in the intercostals. You can see kind of every carve of muscle per se. You go down one more percentage of body fat. Holy shit. Now you see the striations in the ab muscles, like all the veins are pot. It gets scary in a cool way. You know, what the physique is able to do the ability to hit that though, for most people is impossible. They'll never do what is necessary to get down to that. They'll barely do what's necessary to get below 14, right? If every man, and maybe you, I know you're, you're the expert at body fat percentage, what would you say is the ideal body fat percentage for the average person that wants to look good naked? They want to be fit and healthy, but they want to have a little bit more flexibility in their lifestyle. They don't need to be a body. They don't want to be Coach Greg. They, they don't want to get in that shape. They just want to be at their best. What body fat percentage should the average shoot for? I think even more than the average, I think I can go as far as this 90% of people, if I showed them their physique with 15% body fat, and I said, you can get that and you won't suffer to get that and you can keep that, they would be mind blown of how good that would look. 15%. And I believe that would be excessively healthy. And anything past that 15%, like 12, for example, that's purely for cosmetics or for aesthetics for like for looks or for sporting purposes. I don't think that you need to be lower than 15% body fat for health. So for example, I'm at 9% or so. I don't think that my 9% makes me healthier than someone at 15%. It's just for being a cyclist, it's a power to weight ratio. If I gain five pounds of fat, that's going to make me this much slower. If you're a fighter and you have to go up a weight class because you're at 15% versus 10, well, that's, you got to decide, is that worth it? It's like, am I going to lose strength by, by cutting to that weight or am I going to fight better at that weight? So for most people, 15% body fat, that is extremely healthy. But unfortunately the average for men is going to be well over 20%. And for women, 33% we're looking at. So on average, men and women, men are usually about 9% leaner than women. So if you take a girl that's like 33%, a guy's probably going to be like 24, you know, given the same genetics or, or so. And so like my girlfriend is 38%. It's like, like people don't understand, like they'll, they'll say you hate on people who are overweight. I'm like, my girlfriend, 38%. And I'll be like, she's obese. And they'll get mad. You call her obese. I'm like, I'm just going by her fat percentage, not even her BMI. And it's just, it doesn't mean she doesn't look good. I'm just giving you the honest opinion. Like, it's just, that is her percent. Yeah. And a lot of people get triggered because you state the facts, right? There's medically appropriate BMIs that statistically we know 
are prone to certain health outcomes. You can't argue with that data. We know that. Let's accept that. Individually, there's a lot of variances. I'm obese. You're probably obese if we look at a BMI chart. But then we put hip to waist ratio in. We put body composition in. We then show that we're actually in the upper echelon of healthy individuals. So there's, there's more data points that come through. The BMI is a starting point for most. Now, you spent 15%. What I found, and you can agree or disagree, I found those people who start living the lifestyle necessary to be down at 15, just by following that basic lifestyle, they usually start sliding down to the 14, 13. And then our goal is, hey, every guy out there hit 12%. Let's, let's, let's break 20 and shoot for 15. Let's get the 15, stabilize, figure it out. And then let's try and get down to 12 or so. And make that your lifestyle, because I found that living at 12 or 11 or below is no harder than what it took to get to 15. And usually because now they're living a healthy lifestyle, they don't have the drinks as much as they used to because it upset their stomach and they were a little groggy the next day. They start peeling away some of that bad habits that got them over 20. They hit that 15 or so. And then it's easy as long as they're consistent. And a lot of people aren't, you know, and a study recently came out. This is like over 70 percent of people. Say they, they, they don't exercise simply because they're not consistent with it. Well, fucking duh. You know, you have to show up, right? You actually have to swing the stupid ax. But those who do, I find it, it's much easier for them to slide down into that, that 13, probably closer to 13 than 12, because 12 is a slightly different animal. You have any of your clients and what you see, do you see that those who fit, hit 15 slide down easier? I think that the people who are, in loving fitness or love exercise or who, who love doing cardio. I think people who like enjoy it. Like they, like to me going to the gym is like going to the movies. Like I'd be like, I'm going to the gym. Why would you want to do that? You know what I mean? Like my girlfriend, like I don't want to go for a bike ride. Like we're in Italy and I'm like, Hey, let's go on a bike tour. Uh, let's go on a wine tour, I'm like bike tour. So we ride the bike for three hours. And then after the tour's over, I'm like, I'm going to pay extra to go for another ride. And so we do the tour again together. And she has an e-bike. I have a regular bike. She has an e-bike, electric bike that pedals for you, basically. She's Smart. like, I'm so tired. I'm so sore. And I'm like, on the regular. I'm like, I want to keep riding because this is fun for me. I like looking around. She's like, how can you like it? You rode up a hill. It took you 24 minutes to climb the hill. I'm like, but it was fun. But it's like we said earlier, I like the suffering. She's like, you like the pain. She's like, it's not fun. I'm like, but when I got to the top, that was fun. I was like, I made it. So I love it. And so for me, I think that the average person that likes fitness the way I do, or you do, I think that for us, 12%, it's not that hard, but I think for the average person that doesn't really enjoy it, like my girlfriend where she's at 38. And I know like for men, we're saying 12, but if it's a woman, it'd be like 9%. Like, so she'd be probably a 29% guy. If she were in male form for between yeah. to get down to 15%, that'd be pretty hard for her because she doesn't love fitness and she's an athlete. She's a figure skater athlete of the year. You know, she can, she's better than volleyball than me. She's a super athlete and she still doesn't like sports in, in general that much. And so if you love fitness, I think it's easy to get down to 12%, but if you don't I think 15%, probably a more realistic goal for most people. But if you love it, like, like me and my brother, my brother, bike races like me, he's under 15%. He eats anything and everything he wants. Just from doing that cardio and doing it hard, it's easy for him to get down to that percent. But if you don't do cardio, like my mom and dad, they're both, you know, like 30 pounds overweight or what have you, it's, um, it's, it's hard to get down to that because they just don't enjoy the actual activity. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Now, that's actually, that is a good point. Now, before we spoke about weight cutting and preparing actually for bodybuilding versus combat and i'd love to have this conversation for everybody to to listen in and and develop their own thought process on this i'm fascinated with the way bodybuilders prepare for this stage while working traditionally with combat athletes preparing for the ufc octagon right both athletes in the ufc or mixed martial arts wrestling we work with a lot of high level wrestlers here in the, the country 
they have to be as light as possible, as lean as possible. They have to have the highest Wilk score and Watts ratio. They have to be the absolute healthiest, most capable athletic version of themselves to perform. But 24 to 36 hours prior to that performance, they have to be the leanest, lightest, most scraped out version of themselves. There's a way to do that, to deliver them to competition. Bodybuilding is very similar in that you have to be the leanest, lightest version of yourself while being also the biggest muscularly. So that, that is, is a ratio. The performance component of the next day is completely different. Bodybuilders are on stage typically holding six second poses a few times. You know, I don't even know the amount of time you got to be on stage and be relaxed, but nobody's trying to punch you in the face or kick you in the head. Nobody's going to try and choke you out and break your arm for the 15 minutes that you're on stage. And that's a whole different performance component that they have that we consider is kind of going into it. So how does the average bodybuilder prep? I'd love to just hear you walk me through. What's the average way to prep? Maybe like the last three weeks before you have to be dry enough to look your best on stage. Well, I think, first of all, I'd like to say that in bodybuilding, we would all be too lean if we were to switch sports. Like, let's pretend that I was a good fighter. When I'm a bodybuilder, I would be way too lean to be able to fight properly at 4% body fat. It would just not happen. I could make that body fat percentage and enter the, the fight and try to rehydrate and do all the things proper. And I would not function properly. And the reason I know that is because I've entered a powerlifting competition while at four and a half percent body fat, because it was within a week of the bodybuilding. I'm like, well, I'll do this and I'll do that back to back. And I was on all the drugs, all the trends, the tests, every drug you could imagine. And I entered that competition in powerlifting, shredded to the bone, looked like a monster. And I lifted more when I was natural 10 years prior. So I was, I opened, I put 402 pounds on the bar for the bench press. And I'm like, this is, I'm going to smoke this because I'd done 530, 402 and I couldn't get it my opening attempt. And I said, you guys, you misloaded the bar. There's a problem. Like no big deal. Like I'll do it again. And they looked and they're like, no, it wasn't misloaded. I was like, what? I was that weak. And I did it on my second attempt. I barely just barely got it. Cause I didn't even try. I was like, Oh, I'm just going to slam it up. I was barely able to bench press 402. I was on all the drugs in the world. I'd bench 450 natural years prior. And so with, even with all the drugs being dieted to that extent, I have no strength. Once I go below for me, 8% body fat, I don't perform well, whether it's cardio strength, all that bike riding. When I get below 8%, my races, my performance drops. And so if I were a UFC fighter, not that I am, or a boxer, I would know that as a, an athlete, I need 8% body fat in order to sustain the workouts properly, to feel good, to have energy. And so cutting to my extent, it would just destroy me. So I think for every athlete, we all have a, a bottom point or we have a range where we would be most optimal. And so if you get below that range, it's going to dramatically impair, impede your performance. So I don't know, certain UFC fighters, maybe they can fight at 5% or six or seven, but some, maybe it's 10, maybe it's 15. Yeah. And so I would have to go into that and say, well, which weight class will I fight best at? Is it 198? Is it 182? Is it 220? Like you, you have to decide that. And so the last three weeks I, I would be, over dieting, I would be doing too much of everything. So I would never want a UFC fighter or a boxer to go what I to go through what I go through because they would they would lose. So it would make no sense to, for them to do that. So I, I would never have them do what a bodybuilder would do the last three weeks. But powerlifting, I think they could do almost exactly the same thing because in powerlifting, when you get to that competition day, you need to be your strongest. You need to be at a light weight, but still super strong. And if you just keep dieting, you're going to lose your strength. So I think that powerlifting and boxing, wrestling, all that, they would have very similar um, approaches in terms of uh, cutting weight and regaining the weight, dieting and all that, because you have to be at your best on, on that fight day. Yeah. You know what? That It's a great point. And I think part of what made me a successful coach was I had an amateur wrestling background. I was cutting weight for wrestling since I was 13. And then later on in my early 20s, actually through my teens, through my wrestling career, I started powerlifting as a 181, then 198 in the USAPL in the very early days, right? AAU, USAPL here in, on Northeast. That was in high school. 
And then when wrestling was over, I transitioned to still stay competitive and I moved into competitive powerlifting. Having which I moved into the super heavyweight class, which at five foot 10, 282 pounds, I was just a big fat mess. I was a ball, that's you know, big, right? Yeah, just like yeah. sweating, olive oil, and, and garlic, and just like you know, living here in, in Jersey, right? It's all available, but also you have to perform, right? You have to go out there and compete. You got to hit the big three, you got to hit your numbers, you got to get through that training. I was, it was at the end of my career, you, you'll appreciate this, Greg. I was more of like a, a West Side advocate. This is in the mid late 90s, right? 90s, early 2000s. Louis was everywhere, the conjugate method everywhere. I bought the bands that did the thing, and it fucking my squad. I put on 200 pounds. I went from the sixes into the eights as that guy, right? But 35% body fat, at least I had to stop checking. I used to gauge my body fat by how I could grab my fist around my waist, my gut when I drove, right? I drive and I put my fingers under my gut. So I knew how fat I was or how big I was. Um, but what that did, and then training with power lifters, that gave me a very unique opportunity because I was still a strength coach. I was still working with athletes and many of the new mixed martial artists, the team Henzo Gracie here in New York, when they were above the methadone clinic, I was working with a lot of their athletes, even in the late nineties, early two thousands. Pancrase stays in the UFC. Dane and Lorenzo didn't even own the UFC, just a little bit of background. I think why I stood out because you don't pick the athlete, the athlete picks the coach, right? I think they just gravitated because I had that skill set. I had a slightly different vantage point than just the boxing or just the wrestling or just the MMA guys. I had the blend of both weight class oriented sports. I've, I've also said this for years. I was able to better understand the performance demands of those weight classes and how the athletes trained in those two extremes. Amateur wrestling, that's six minutes of all fucking go, right? You've seen it in a wrestling match, right? It's six minutes of nonstop explosion, too. You get more points for big throws. That's a max deadlift 10 times in a match, right? Um, and then with, with the athletes, so I, I agree I, that, you know, what you say is, is power, it is more akin to powerlifting. Although when they're on stage and they're flexing the UFC guys, they look like, you know, local level physique athletes maybe bikini athletes one could say that's what these ufc athletes look like well so it's the physical representation but the performance demand i would agree is, is more like the powerlifting side yeah like when i'm bodybuilding and i'm on stage and, and posing is hard don't get me wrong but it's not that hard i mean compared to wrestling or or perform compared to running like if i'm on my bodybuilding show day and i'm like i'm i'm, I'm winning my pro card or whatever that day if you had said go run a mile, I couldn't have ran a mile. You know what I mean? I couldn't have. And this is from a guy that could do triathlons in the past. It's because you don't have the energy and you're so dehydrated. Like when we're bodybuilding, like when I make weight. So like my last show, I had to make 185. That's classic physique. That's for my height, five foot six. I can only weigh 185. I weigh in at 185 and I get up to 187. So I'm only gaining back two pounds because if I gain back 10, 15, which I've made 179 and competed above 198, six hours later in a, in a power lift. I, I, one year I, I made, I was just under 180 and I won the powerlifting competition. Then I reweighed again for the bench only at two separate competitions, squat bench and deadlift, then the bench only I reweighed in and this is nationals and I won both. And I weighed above 198. So I jumped up two weight classes. I'm probably the only guy to weigh in two different weight classes and jump one and win both. And I only won the, the 220 class by like five pounds. I remember this quite well, but I had gained, I guess it was 19 pounds or so from 179 to over 198 point, whatever. I remember just guzzling the water right before stepping on stage because I wanted to, to, to be in that weight class just to prove a point kind of thing, just to be funny. But yeah, wow. so I gained, you know, like 18, 19 pounds from the morning to the afternoon competing, but in bodybuilding, I mean, my gut, if you would have saw it, it would have just been horrible. Like I would have got last place. Yeah. So in bodybuilding, you can't regain all that weight. So a lot of people think that, you know, you compete at 212, you make the weight class, and then the next day you're up 10, 15 pounds. It's not like uh, wrestling or, or UFC or powerlifting where you regain 20 pounds. You have to stay within five pounds or so, because if not, you're going to spill over. You're not going to look tight. You have to have that small waist. In classic physique, you're doing a vacuum pose. If I have food in my stomach, 
what's my vacuum going to look like? It won't look very good. Yeah. So it's, it's a lot different. So in, in bodybuilding, we're, we're keeping our weight the same, maybe a couple pounds difference versus powerlifting. And, you know, I've coached people 20 pounds in a day, that kind of weight gain, that's kind of normal. Not everyone can gain that much. I, I, guys with more muscle tend to have more glycogen they can store. Um, and depending on how many diuretics you're using, like when I was doing drug tested competitions, you couldn't use diuretics. So I just sweat, you know, in a snowsuit and doing cardio and whatnot. But as I got older, now that I'm doing non-tested stuff, it's just, I'll use diuretics a lot easier to make weight doing that. Yeah. And the diuretics, that's a scary thing for a lot of athletes. You know, we've heard of, you know, in the early days, it was Mohammed Beneziza and Paul Dillette. I remember those because I was, I was very bodybuilding yeah. focused in those days, right? It's still bad. And how, I mean, they, they tried to ban it for a little while. Clearly it, it, it came right back. It's everywhere. Um, what is your take on diuretic use? Is, is it is it absolutely necessary? I mean, what are the dangers? Does it scare you the most or it's not as big of a deal as everybody makes it? Well, I've done 42 shows natural with no diuretics and I've done wow. about 17 with them. And so I can remember the differences. And so for me, I usually will compete two pounds drier with diuretics than without them. And diuretics is a lot easier because I can I can fix any mistake. So if I happen to drink a bit of water and I have the diuretic or drink too much water, it's it's going to go. So it's just like, yeah. it's easier to coach with diuretics. Without them, you have to, if you drink too much water, well, it's not going to go. It's too late. So yeah. it's a lot easier with diuretics than not. But in general, the look is a little bit better with the diuretics than without. There's some competitors that won't use it at all, but some guys will use a diuretic and it flattens them out a lot. Everybody's different. I can use a ton of diuretics and it doesn't really hurt me. Other people can take one and it messes them up. So it's, it's tough because if you haven't taken it before, you don't know how you're going to react. So when I'm coaching somebody, I'll be like, have you ever used a diuretic before? And if they say, yes, I've taken five. And then you say, well, what kind? And so there's different kinds. It depends on what they're using. Um, some are more dangerous than others, like Lasix, super dangerous, can really mess you up. But something like hydrochlorothiazide with triamterine, like that would be like a doctor prescribed medication for like high blood pressure. Relatively safe. I don't want to say it's safe, but relatively safe because I could take probably 20 of them and not die versus if you take 20 Lasix, it just keeps working. I find there's a ceiling effect. I could take one or two diuretics and it's going to lose more water than if I add 10 more on top of that. I might lose five pounds from one diuretic and I take 10 and I lose six pounds. It doesn't keep working to that extent versus Lasix going to just keep losing some weight. A lot of guys, um, they in a competition, they won't be at the weight class. They can inject Lasix. And so that can work in 10 minutes. And, and so you can definitely lose too much water, too many electrolytes, end up in the hospital, you can die. But there's uh, milder ones like aldactone, which has a much longer half-life, like per, for, for example, a day, most people are taking that one or two days before the show or even longer versus the hydrochlorothiazide, which a half-life of maybe like 10 hours or so, like it, it basically it works for about, well, probably half-life of actually four or five hours, but it works for about 10 hours in your body versus the aldactone is going to be like one or two days versus Lasix. It's a few hours. So depending on the diuretic that you're using, it's going to really have a big effect on how much water you're going to lose. And are you already dehydrated? Because if you are, you take a diuretic, it hardly does anything because you're already dehydrated. So it, it depends on your goals and what you've done before, but they're definitely dangerous, but Making weight is not a safe thing, no matter how you do it. True. Now, with that, the water cut, how how do you guys typically cut your water? Do you taper? Do you pyramid? Is it a reverse pyramid? Like, when do you cut the water off completely? And how much? And would that allow? be for bodybuilding or for powerlifting? For, bo for bodybuilding. I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. For bodybuilding. For bodybuilding, there's two, there's two mindsets and I'm a I'm hundred percent on one mindset. There's one where they taper down. They'll do like say four liters, then two liters and one liter. They just kind of slowly take it down. My mindset is it's all at once. I'll go from drinking eight liters of water a day, every day to just yeah. none, Let's just pull it out all at once. And usually I like to do that about 17, 18 hours before the competition. And then I like to carb up late. Some guys will carb deplete. Well, everyone pretty much will carb deplete, but I'm a believer that you don't need three days to carb load. I don't think it takes that long for your glycogen stores to fill up. So every coach is different. I'm more of a carb up late and you can't screw up. If you carb up too early, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, 
a lot of times you're already carb loaded to the max by Thursday and then you keep carbing up and then you spill over and you look watery and you're not as lean and they'll say, oh, I screwed it up. With my methods where you carb up late, you pretty much can't screw up because you're not going to be able to overdo carbs in a day. Like you just can't. And if you're not drinking a bunch of water, how are you spilling over? Your stomach is like spilling over would be like your guts hanging out. You've got too much food in there. You look watery. The cuts aren't there. If you do it my method, chances are you're going to be shredded for sure. You're going to be peeled. You might not be as full, but you're going to be peeled. So there's kind of a, a trade-off. The, the more you weigh, the fuller you're going to be, but the less condition you're going to look. So you have to decide, do I want to look shredded to the bone or do I want to risk it and come in a bit more full? And my, my personal experience watching other people, the, those who try to come in more full, they're not quite as lean. I'll give you a good example. Antoine Vaillant, when he beat me at the Canadian Nationals, he won the overall title. He got the first pro card, and then I got second to him in the overall. I won light heavy. He was super heavy. He was 246. I was 193 or so. Wow. He won. I got second in that show. There was a couple of Mr. Olympia guys in there, like Al Dura and Zane Watson. I'd beaten them at the time. Obviously, they're a lot better than me now. But at the time, I was, I was more conditioned, and so I was able to get ahead of them. Antoine was definitely spilt over. He looked really watery. Still, I didn't have enough muscle to beat him. But if he had have done it my method, he would have been so much leaner and drier. And it would have just been a more obvious win. And later, if you see him like when he just competed, just ridiculously shredded. But when he won the Canadian Nationals back in 2012, wasn't nearly lean enough. And I remember talking to him. He's like, yeah, I drank eight liters of water today. And that was the day before the show. And I'm like, you drank eight liters of water on a Friday and you're competing in the morning. I was like, you're not going to be lean enough. And if you look at him in the morning compared to at night, he's much better at night than in the morning. And the previous year he had lost to Mike Johnson, I believe. And he wasn't lean enough. And I was like, wow, Mike is, I want Mike Johnson won his pro card. Antoine got second. Antoine looked really watery in the morning and he came back at night and he looked amazing because he had another 10 hours, maybe he took diuretics. And yeah. so when they, they said Antoine in second place or whatever, he didn't win. The audience was like, what do you mean? He like, he won, but he didn't look like that in the morning when the judging took place. And so it all depends on like, how lean are you at the right time? And what are you doing for diuretics? How, when did you cut out the water and so on? It's interesting with bodybuilding, there's, there's two phases of the competition. What are your thoughts on combining those two? So it's, you show up, you prejudge, you go through the poses, you do the nighttime version of the, the, the show and it's done instead of the morning, because there's, you have to peak twice. There, there's a lot of the adjustments. It's a little confusing from a fans. I've never competed or I've trained with bodybuilders, but I'm a fan of the sport. It's confusing because for that exact reason, you go to the night show, you're like, holy shit, Antoine is amazing but he looked like a, a water buffalo earlier that day and got marked down. What are your thoughts on that? I think it should be all judged at once this yeah. morning and night thing. I think it's silly. I mean, I've judged shows and I've promoted shows. So I've had my own shows and they want us to have the morning show and the night show, but I've also been to shows where they do it at once. They have, all, for example, all the bikini competitors, you go in the morning and you do your whole thing. And then your bodybuilders, you come at night. And so you have a, one show of this and one show of that. It could be classic physique, morning, bodybuilding, night. Classic physique, like what Chris Bumstead does, bodybuilding, like the two separate. And it's all at once. You do your comparisons and then you do your judging. Because the night show, the, the judging is already done. So the last show I judged, I watched everything in the morning. I gave them all my places. And then they come and do their night show and they do their routines and stuff. And it's like, we already know who won. Like the judges, we're like, you know, we're kind of like sitting there. We already, we already judged this, and they could, they could have eaten ten pounds of cheeseburgers and come out there with a bloated stomach and done the routine horribly, and they're still going to win because it was already judged. So I'm not really a fan of that, but it's shows are so long that to do the judging and the the video and the posing, the show would be ten hours long. And so, how do you make a show that's presented? Because most people watching a show. They're not fans of bikini and bodybuilding and classic and all this. They're they're there to see their friend or their girlfriend or their whoever. Like you're going to the cheer one person, and it's ten hours. You can't do that. So you almost need like bikini show, a bodybuilding show, all separate. But because it's a show and you're all there together, it's hard to do that. So it's like a compromise. So that's kind of why they do these things. So 
there's not much it can do, but as a, as a true bodybuilding fan, if I had to choose, I'm always watching the morning show. Cause that's when the judging happens. I want to see them come out together and I want to do the comparisons and watch the routine. That's just for fun to me. I like watching competitors go back and forth. Yeah. Great point. I, I agree. It's too much. You don't want to see every all seven different divisions however many divisions there are you want to say it's a ton of time and it takes a long time anyway like it's notoriously they're very long so i think it hurts the viewership you compare bodybuilding to the ufc a lot of people like to do and there's similarities but bodybuilding has been around for a heck of a lot longer than the ufc in combat sports and you look at the difference in viewers to those well bodybuilding less exciting except for more of the educated eye because we all understand punches and kicks to the face right there's drama inherent drama built into that so it, it pulls people in but bodybuilding can do a hell of a lot better to gain viewers i'm a fan like i'm a guy that should be targeted to pay for the bodybuilding shows or access the streams or be on the apps I still can't find pictures of a show. I can't even find a, a Instagram page that's posting timely what happened. There's no play-by-play. -play. Like every MMA site, every local blogger has a play-by-play -play of round one in the UFC and their opinion on the fight. In real time, there, there's certainly no lack. Thousands of illegal streams and such. So bodybuilding gets in his own way. Like, is there a political reason for that? Because if I'm not an organizer. Right. I'm not an official. I'm not economically enticed to figure out better ways to improve the sport of bodybuilding. But shit, I can sit here and probably come up with half a dozen at least that will dramatically improve it. It seems like there's no desire to do so. And I don't understand why from an outsider's perspective. They certainly could be doing a lot better. And I do think that it's harder. UFC is more exciting. Fighting is more exciting because it's like right in your face, a knockout versus bodybuilding. And with all honesty, and I'm part of it, it's a beauty pageant. We're judging who is the best looking guy on stage. Maybe not the face, but the overall body or the package. And UFC, there's storylines. There's more interest. Um, I think bodybuilding needs to do a better job of creating some drama going into the show. Like when you look at Conor McGregor and the back and forth that go on and the, the, the banter, it's exciting. And so bodybuilding, it's almost like we're all nice friends. Hat, like there's no like excitement or bad blood or like, I'm going to get you, I'm going to take you out. And if there was, I think more people would follow that. You know, look at the UFC where, where they, they have all the fighters in a house competing against each other each week. And you get to know the characters. I think bodybuilding, we don't know enough of the characters Nowadays, more people are starting to like Chris Bumstead. People watch his YouTube channel. They get to know him. And then when he enters the show, people like him and then they want him to win and they're cheering for him. So if you had more guys like myself, for example, even with a YouTube channel, if I enter a competition, more people are like they're familiar with you. And so that will help more people want to go watch a show. Um, as far as covering the shows, I've covered shows like this, like the way you're describing, like I'm going through all the winners and you don't get the views. And so I'm motivated by who, what are they going to watch from me? And if I do a show on like, for example, Ian Blair from Canada, just won against Antoine Vaillant at a show in Vancouver. I'm not covering the show because there's not going to be anyone that watches it. Well, and by no one, I mean like half as many as another topic. So I'm more, I'm more likely going to cover a show that's more, interesting that the people want to see now if ian and antoine had kind of like a battle or they're like calling each other out or or i'm going to beat you and it was more interesting there's more people would be like who who won that show who's the better guy like who come so there's a little bit of like there's lack of drama or excitement that's going on in bodybuilding that's preventing people from really wanting to see it yeah I also think that when you want to find MMA news, where do you go? What websites do you go to for MMA news and updates? I would go and watch like Chael Sonnen, to be honest. Like I've seen quite a bit of his channel, like, but it would be uh, UFC or I type their names in on, on YouTube, um, you know, but you uh, with the UFC, it's like I'll watch almost every pay-per-view on Saturdays. So it's like you're, you're watching on TV bodybuilding. They don't even have the Mr. Olympia to watch like on TV. And if they did, like, imagine if they would have had like Jay Cutler and Kai Green and Ronnie Coleman, and if they were actually interviewing them and following their training leading up to the show, 
Yeah. It would do wonders. Like, like imagine if they covered all the top IP pros, the big Rammies, and you had a show where you watched him uh, getting ready for it. It would be a huge difference. Absolutely. And I think guys like Bumstead do that rather well, where he has built his own UFC prime time, the, the behind the scene vignettes, right, of prep and training camp and off season. You see his dog and you relate to the guy, right? You know, that, that's kind of the, you're, you're right on that. It's unfortunate that the powers that be have never taken that step to invest into the athletes under their brand like Dana White has. Dana understands yeah. completely. He's the brand, but you have to build up the faces to draw people into the stadium, right? Into the venue to watch the pay-per-views and, and buy all the merch, which people do. And it was done pretty good at one point. There was a, a, an organization called the WNSO back in the day in 2000. And I used to compete with them. And it was like a drug tested competition type thing. And I was I was the champ. Like I won the, the amateurs. I won the pro division for that. And it was on TSN. And so I would be at the local bar and I'm watching TSN. I'm watching myself posing on stage. It's like, there you are. And they're interviewing you and you're talking. And so that was pretty good. But unfortunately, I don't know what they did, but. I don't know if they didn't pay for venues or something happened. They even had a magazine and it just went away. I don't even know if they have a, an organization to this day, but for a while it was really popular. They had big prizes. It was quite the competition. And so you could see, and they came out of nowhere, like literally one year, all of a sudden that was the thing to do. And so if they were able to do it from nothing, you would think that the IFBB, which is already established, could do it. Yeah. They just have to do, I, and I, I don't have the skill set to figure out what they need to do, but I just know that somebody with like Dana White's talent could figure out how to do it and promote it. Yeah. I don't know that they're having the conversation. They might just say, Hey, status quo, we're all pulling in seven figures into our personal accounts. Why are we going to work any harder? It's, it's a legacy, right? We're going to pass it down through nepotism. It's going to stay here. Family's good. We run the show, carte blanche, wherever we go. You know, like that's the way it seems. A good old boys network, if you will, where they're not really pushing. Maybe Jake Wood coming in at the Olympia. Maybe they, The Rock, as they said years ago, but he doesn't really seem truly vested in it anyway. Um, it looks like it's going to be status quo until new blood comes in and changes it. Why with technology, man, why is someone not using their iPhone 13 at the very least at the judges table to be just casting the screen? I could live stream that right with my phone. It's right? funny. They that. charge like 50 bucks for like a live stream and it's not even good quality. You're watching the video and you're like, I can't see the conditioning. It's just a bad, I'm like thinking I'm judging and I can literally put on my Instagram stories and the, the competitors will look better than these, these live streams that are, you're paying 50 bucks for crazy. Now, one area I want to talk about and people are going to get mad if we don't is the calories in versus calories out. That's, you know, you, you, you stand behind calories in, calories out. And I say, fuck calories. Let's focus over here first. And I think it'll be fun to have the conversation to explain our viewpoints. I don't know that we're so far away in principle. I think it's the practical application is where the difference lies. So Seco, you know, calories in, calories out. You got a lot of great branding behind that, which is awesome. Explain your philosophy with regards to calories and weight loss. And then I'll, I'll jump in with mine. Okay. Like before I even hear your opinion, I feel like you're going to hundred percent agree with everything I'm going to say, because like, if you don't, then it's going to be a great argument. Cause I'm going to be like, there's no I way you're right. I disagree. So, <laughs> I so, so. so calories in calories out. So the only way to lose weight is you need to be in a calorie deficit. And so if you burn off more calories than you take in, you're going to lose weight. And so every human being on this planet can lose weight. The people who say, I have a poor metabolism, my hormones don't work, underactive thyroid, pregnancy, all that stuff. Every single one of them would lose weight if they lowered their calories lower enough so that they burn off more than they took in in a day. So if you burn off 2000 calories a day and you eat 1500, you're going to gain weight. But if you burn off 2000 calories a day, and you eat 2,500, you're going to lose weight dictated by that calorie deficit. And it takes a 3,500 calorie drop to lose one pound of body fat. There's 3,500 calories in one pound of fat. So 500 calorie deficit per day will yield one pound of body fat drop approximately per week. And 
For me, I think that most people, they cut calories too low. They try to lose too quickly. One pound of fat loss a week is very, very good. I think that most people are thinking, no, I want to lose two, three, four, five pounds a week. And so they starve themselves. And when you do starve yourself, your metabolism does slow down, but it doesn't mean you can't burn calories. It just means you continuously would need to eat even less or do even more activity. So I don't disagree, but I don't completely agree. And let's go a little further. When we make this statement and, and Lane Norton is, has tried to refute what I said, Lane's wrong, which is awesome because Lane's long, wrong about most things in life. But <laughs> all right, let's see it. I can't wait. <laughs> we talk about calories in calories out. And I say, well, no, arbitrarily, that is not 100% true. Because if I consume 100 calories of low net nutrient foods with z like only the only fats or only simple carbohydrates, no protein. Well, that is not the same as eating, let's say, the same allotment of calories from wild-caught salmon only. If I pick just donuts or just wild-caught salmon, and this is the issue that Lane had pointed out, those who eat the wild-caught salmon will build more lean muscle tissue. They will likely burn and metabolize stored body fat. Whether or not they will weigh the exact same at the end of the day is doubtful, although the calories were equal. So if the calories are equal, we limit the macros and we, we clearly make different food choices, that is going to be a completely different outcome. So that's why I was starting to say, hey, listen, Seco, yes, I understand the first law, but there's context to this. So what I try and do is I try and explain more of the context. Calories matter when we're eating the, the proper macronutrient ratio for our determined goals. Calories matter when we are netting the proper micronutrients necessary for all cellular activity of we, the biological organisms that we are. We have to start there. So we, we say, let's start at the micro level, let's build it out, and then we find the appropriate caloric ceiling. What we also say is eating higher net nutrient foods allow you to maximize your micronutrient intake at a lower total caloric ceiling. So you can actually eat less food and be more nutrient sufficient instead of nutrient deficient. So which is why I say before we get to calories in, calories out is the end all be all. We have to contextually talk about that because the quality of food matters more at first than calories do. So we don't start with calories. We start at quality. So we don't count calories, make calories count. That's what we're saying. Make the calories that you must eventually eat. Because of course, I eat approximately 3,200 calories a day. If I dropped it to 2,900 calories, I would start to lean up faster. Had I been eating 3,200 calories per day of donuts only or wild caught salmon only, I would be two completely different humans from a health, fitness, athleticism perspective. That is my contention. Yeah. So basically I know exactly what you're saying. And so it's the same point that Andrew Huberman was made. I had called him out for saying that it wasn't calories in calories out. He said it, it like he was saying exactly what you said. And what he meant was that the type of foods that you're eating can affect the energy out equation. And so, for example, if you eat a hundred calories of spinach versus a hundred calories of jelly beans, it's not the same, even though it's the same amount of calories, because if you eat 100 calories of spinach, it's going to affect the thermic effect of food. Some of the calories are going to be burnt off digesting that fiber. Your, your, your body has to work harder to convert fiber into body fat than sugar into body fat or fat into fat. So if you eat butter, it's already closer molecularly to fat uh, than fiber. So it takes a lot more work to digest and convert uh, spinach into body fat as butter into body fat. And so if two people both have the same exact calories, 2000 of shit, 2000 of all healthy, they're not going to look the same in the end, but it's still calories in calories out. It's just the person who's eating healthier food is going to burn off more calories. So it's affecting the energy out part of the equation. The energy in is the same. They're both getting 2000 calories each person, but one is using those calories differently and burning off more of them. Yep. So what Lane had said was, I, I said, hey, calories don't matter until you balance out the quality of food. First, Lane had said Dolce is wrong because he's using a flawed hypothesis. Basically he said, I'm trying to trick everyone by saying, 
if person A eats 2,000 calorie of donuts, person B eats 2,000 calories of wild caught salmon. Lane said, hey, that's not fair because salmon has more protein. So it has to be a protein to protein food. Well, his reasoning totally negates his stance in that then the macros do matter before the calories. I don't so, know if there's one that matters first or after. I don't see, I don't really understand that. But like, I mean, if you're eating 2000 calories of sugar and that's it in your diet and somebody's eating 2000 calories of protein, carbs, and fats, then obviously they're going to be better. They're going to have more muscle, but the calorie in calorie out is still going to apply because if you ate 2000 calories of all sugar and you burn off 2,500 calories, you're still going to lose weight in the same way that if you're, do you know what I mean? Like if you I burn off more saying. calories, it's automatically going to happen, but it won't yield the same physique. So calories in calories out doesn't mean that you will look the same. If that was the case, then I could say it doesn't matter what you eat. As long as you're in a deficit, you're going to look the same. It's not true. If somebody's eating enough protein, they're going to build more muscle. And although they're in the same deficit, they're not going to have the same physique. You're not going to look good. If you don't eat protein, you're going to have no muscle. So you would still lose weight. It's still calories in calories out, but you still need the proper macro and micronutrients in order to build a quality physique, but the dieting and, and losing weight, it's still going to be dependent on the calorie in calorie out. And in, in saying that if you eat all healthy, but overeat all healthy, all salmon, but you eat too much of it, too many egg whites, too much spinach, and you eat too many calories, you're still going to get fat, in other words. Yeah, and I think that takes it. So our stuff seems to be more contextual in that it's much harder to overeat apples. It's much easier to overeat donuts. So yes. again, by focusing on quality of nutrients first, your body self-regulates in many ways. It's very difficult to overeat earth-grown foods, as we call it. Whole foods, people think they can buy cereal and that, that's fine. It's, it's much harder. The body self-regulates. There's cofactors inherent into the food that help send signals to um, signal satiety and, and you know nutrient satisfaction and such. So when we say the, the quality Again, I, I don't want to beat it, but it, it gives context to the listener. Once we focus on the quality first, man, it's so much easier to get your calories that are appropriate to be fully satisfied, fully fueled, have all the nutrients you need instead of the hyper palatable food, which a lot of people, Lane being one, again, I'll keep beating him because he's you know very vocal about it. He's the Pop-Tart coach. He's like, you know, pop if it fits your macros kind of thing, which I'm a hundred percent against, it's like, I'm listening to you speak and I'm like, you think exactly like me, you're just saying it in a different way. But like, I'm a hundred percent on what you're saying. I think it's way better to not worry about how many calories you're eating, but eat the right kind of calories because you'll naturally be eating where you're supposed to be. Like you're a fan of eating like the fibers as you're talking about satiety. That's why I'm telling people like get my cookbook and just eat anything from it. And it's going to be easy to lose weight versus if you eat donuts and sugar and track it and it's like 2,500, I'm in a deficit. It's only going to work until your willpower runs out because you're not full. You're not satisfied. You're not satiated. You're not getting the right micro and macronutrients. That's why you got to eat a lot of vegetables and fruits to be full, have a variety of healthy foods in your diet, which is so important. Calories in, calories out still works. But if you don't have the discipline to stop eating and put the fork down when you're eating a donut or chicken nuggets and like junky food, then you're not going to be able to lose weight because you're not going to stick to your diet. Yeah. And you're probably aware of the study that says those who eat hyper palatable foods tend to eat 167% more calories in a four hour period of time. That it's too hard to stop. Yeah. Can't. Highly palatable foods, fats and sugars in combination, like ice cream, hog and dogs. Like I can't eat that stuff. I can't stop. You put ice cream and cereal in front of me and chocolate bars. And I start, there's no stopping, but if you give me a healthy meal, I can eat till I'm full and I'm done. I stop eating. How good do you feel after the healthy meal, whatever, whatever it might be, a Mediterranean salad or your wild caught salmon or whatever you, you make that you love instead of eating the equal calories in potato chips and ice cream, though we are seduced, right? The, the, the lust for food, we're seduced by those savory, hyper palatable foods. When we eat that robust grandma's cooking, you know, healthy grandma cooking type of food, 
the difference, and this is what a lot of people don't get, Greg, and you probably do. I definitely do. Most humans don't understand how it truly feels to feel good. When I ask someone, hey, how you feeling? I feel good. No, you don't. You don't know what it feels to fucking feel good because you're at 24% body fat with hypertension. You drank three beers last night and you had enriched wheat bread. Your gut's a fucking mess. You got a shit that will not come out. You feel terrible right now. I feel good. I just had a, a one wiper, which I like to call the coveted one wiper, <laughs> right? You know, so it's like, it's a whole different lifestyle that people just don't get. Yeah. And, and th this is the funny thing with how you feel good. Feeling good is only a measure of how do you feel compared to when you didn't feel as good. And so yeah. if you're at 25% body fat and you can walk 10 minutes, you feel pretty good compared to if you were 30% body fat, but they don't know how it feels to be able to go for a one hour bike race and burn a thousand calories and have 10 or 15% body fat and to eat something healthy because they've never been there. So they don't know what they're missing. So they yeah. feel good because they don't know how good they could feel until they get there. Yeah. Fasted cardio. What are your thoughts? Faster fed cardio. I'll just leave it at that. What are your thoughts? I want to influence. For me personally, I don't like doing fasted cardio, but it's not to say that it's not good. It's just that if I do fasted cardio, I don't have as much energy to go as hard as if I do fed cardio. Um, so if I eat something and have more energy, I can put out more power. So I always do like my cardio is based on like my bike. So if I don't eat and I go and ride for an hour, I can't sustain the same power as if I ate something. And yeah. so I'm not a fan of doing it fasted because I don't have the same power output. I can't do the, the work to the extent that I wanted to. If somebody else can, and that's up to them, I find that I don't have that power. But if you do, that's fine. As far as burning fat, it doesn't burn more fat. It might burn more fat during the activity, but as soon as you eat after, it, it, the roles reverse. So it's still gonna be at the end of the day, calories in calories out so whether you did it fasted or not at the end of the day how many calories did you eat to decide how much fat you burn so i'm not a fan of telling people you need to go out and do fasted cardio to burn more fat but if they want to i'll say that's fine as long as it's not hurting your performance and i have done fasted cardio in the past i've tried it i thought it was the big thing 20 Five years ago, I would get up and go do my 90 minute bike ride for, for bodybuilding to diet. And I would not burn that many calories, had no energy. I'm like, what's the point? I'm better off just to eat and have a better workout. Gotcha. And so you ride the, the bike. What kind of heart rate are you pushing? Um, during a race, I can sustain like my anaerobic threshold is around 167. So yes. if I go at 167, that's pretty much like my max, but that's influenced by many factors like caffeine intake, the environment, the temperature of the room, uh, anabolic drift. Like as the ride goes longer, my ride, my heart rate will go up higher. So like when I start a race, it'll typically be in the one fifties and one sixties. And by the end of the race, it'll be in the one sixties and one seventies. It just kind of drifts up. And it'll feel the same effort, like it'll feel just as hard, but my heart rate will be 10 beats higher. Um, I would say if in an average race, the average for the hour is in the 160s, but I can max out sometimes 190 at the end of the race if it's for like a 30 second or more sustained all out effort following two minutes of very hard effort. Like if I really try to get my one, my, 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 my max heart rate and oddly enough, my max heart rate's gone up almost 15 beats in the last four years. I used to like one seventies was just all out to get there. But now sometimes I'll ride one seventy something for several minutes and, and not have that much trouble. So it's actually gone up quite a bit. So um, I don't, like heart, depending if you have bradycardia or tachycardia, like higher or lower average resting heart rate or, or, or maximum heart rate, sorry, that can influence where you can do heart rate cardio at. Like I have some friends that will go at 210 for 20 minutes and it sounds impossible, but it's like for them, that's just a normal heart rate because they have a high heart rate. Others, it might be 140, but they're going faster than me. So yeah. What do you know your resting heart rate? 47 to 48. Damn. Wow. That's good. It was in the sixties before I started losing weight. And when I was a uh, triathlete in my teens, it was the lowest it's ever been was around 38, 39. 
just under 40. And it would always be lower when I dieted. So when my body fat percentage goes down, my resting heart rate drops. So it would typically be around 42 or 43. And then I would do a bodybuilding competition and my resting heart rate would go down. And I argued in my head that that's my metabolism slowing down to save energy because I'm on a calorie restricted diet and my body's trying to conserve energy for like for an adaptation to starving myself. Cause once you're getting down to six you know, percent body fat, you feel like shit. And so your heart rate just slows down. I'd even get dizzy standing up. I'd have like hypotension. Like my, my uh, 120 over 80 is like the standard heart rate. When I was dieting, it would be like 105 over 60, typically, wow. like often. And right now it's about 110 over 75. So my blood pressure is actually very good. Like I've never had high blood pressure, even on test and trend, like be like 135 over 80. Okay. And you were riding the bike still? during that period of time do you think that no when i was on trend and test in 10 years i stopped all cardio like i used to do the the triathlons and i said no cardio is going to lose my muscle i need to not do any cardio so i avoided cardio and then i was like this is dumb like why am i doing this i don't feel good remember i mentioned i was walking the dog and i'd be out of shape like just going for a walk like at a normal pace and i was like this is just bad and I'm like, I have to do something about it. So I started doing cardio again and it really hasn't hurt me that much. Like, I mean, obviously I have less muscle, but I think that's because I'm not on all the drugs. Yeah. That's crazy. Now UFC, you're a big fan. You watch all the fights. Give me your take on I do, who's, who's your favorite fighter. Who do you prefer to watch fight most? Now, the funny thing with me is I'm horrible with names. So I'm <laughs> watching and I, I recognized all the fighters. And I'm like watching them and I'm like, I have no idea people's names. I was a school teacher. I couldn't remember the kids' names. I would see them in, in the hallway and I'm like, I don't know who you are because you're not sitting in that desk. I know that person, Samantha, but I don't know who you are. So like for me to sit and name all the names in the UFC, I would have a hard time doing that. But Patty Paddington, Patty, they call him Patty the Fatty. I'm just really into him now because he's really outspoken and yeah. I'm following his his bulking and cutting and, and he's on a diet and he's just really outspoken with what he's eating. And I just think it's hilarious. I've done a few videos on him. So I'm all about him. So I'm excited to see how he does in the future. So he would be the guy I really want to see the most right now. Nice. He's an exciting fighter too, but I agree that, well, maybe I, I do or don't agree that his massive weight fl fluctuate fluctuations, I understand, but he's also taking years off his career. No doubt, full stop. If he's good enough to go long enough, he's ruining the last third of his career as a result of, of the abuse he's putting on his performance body. Have you seen the choice of foods that he eats, like the ice creams and the 10,000 calories after, and he goes up to 205 and I'm like, why that much? Like, it's not benefiting you. Like, why not stick to 185? I mean, he's cutting to 155. Why do you have to gain 50 pounds and then cut that all? I will watch him. He's like, yeah, I haven't eaten yet. He was training for three hours and his first meal was at one o'clock and he watched him eat like a salad and a chicken. And I was like, you're on 2000 calories a day training like three hours plus more boxing practice. I was like, so you're starving yourself all to get into this weight class just because you can. I'm like, why not be somewhere in the middle? Like have some balance. Like don't quite gain that much. You know what? Like, I'm not saying you should maintain like 10% body fat year round or something, but like, let's be somewhere in the middle. Like let's gain 30 pounds after a fight, not 50. Yeah. Well, at that body weight, you know, competing as a 155er, man, that's a big percentage of his total body weight he has to suck down. And also, he's creating more fat cells through the, these extremes, right? So he's laying down more fat cells, more storage sites, and now creating more stubborn storage sites, more white fat cells, which are harder to lose and, you know, more challenging metabolically as he continues. So as he's a young man going through his 20s and then into the 30s, you know how rapidly the body changes. Also, the brain chemistry, the signaling gets completely fucked up through the massive weight cuts, but also through the head trauma. That's we we under we know this. The science is there. It's been there for decades now. We understand completely what's happening to see athletes like this with promising futures. I understand you understand where this story ends i know it completely how this ends he will one day take a fight he will start his fight week and it won't go the same way it always has I've, i'm doing the same stuff i'm always doing but it just doesn't work 
I was in the sauna for two hours. I lost 0.8 pounds. I don't know what's going on. My body stopped sweating. I got dizzy. My kidneys really started to hurt. I had to go to the hospital and they had to give me an IV. I don't know what happened. I did what I always, this, this is the same right. story. We, we hear dozens of times, right? This is the story. And then he'll never be the same. He'll get knocked out from some glancing blow that just kind of dings off the top of his head. Some incidental contact will put him down. And from that point forward, little things will always put him down. We've seen this more times than we want to see it. But this is that's how the story ends without a dramatic overhaul to his current lifestyle and his his approach to his sport and profession. Yeah. Now you, you mentioned like he won't one day be able to make weight. Now I don't know the name of this guy, but he's the, he was the lightweight champion and he missed the weight class. And there was a bit of controversy that the scale was off. Do you know what I'm talking about? It was, Charles Oliveira. I did a video. On yes. It. Now, what do you think happened there? Because I have my own opinion. I think that he got up in the middle of the night and ate food and that he screwed up and it's all on him. And other people are like, no, it's all the scale. And I'm like, I've cut weight. 70 times for powerlifting meets and I have my scale with me and I go and check the scale in my scale. And if I'm off by a certain amount, they give you two hours to lose that weight. And if you can't make weight in two hours, you're on the brink of death. Like you are on the door. You need to go to the hospital. And the fact that he came back and won that fight, there's no way in my mind I can think that he just couldn't lose any weight. Like you, you would put on a bunch of clothes, a snowsuit, five layers of clothes and go for a walk for an hour and you'd lose a pound. There's no way you can't sweat out a pound, like one pound in an hour with a little bit of clothes. Like easily, I could lose four pounds in an hour if I had to. Even when I'm, well, not when I'm at the death door, but like on a normal day, like it would be easy. I've, I've, I've gone to powerlifting meets and I've missed weight and I've been over and I'm like, I got 2.2 pounds to lose and I got two hours. And usually, you know, in an hour taking my time, I lose the weight. So what happened to him? Like, what's the scoop there? Well, first... Charles has missed weight five times in his UFC career. One of these times was against my athlete, Nick Lentz, when we flew to Brazil to fight Charles in a rematch. Their first fight ended due to no contest because Charles threw an illegal knee because Nick was kicking his ass. So he cheated to get out, right? Then we have the rematch. We fly to Brazil to fight him. We get there on Tuesday, Greg. We're in the hot tub just hanging out. Charles, we can see the sauna is in the sauna in plastics laying on the floor dead on Tuesday, on Tuesday. We he's already dead by the time we unpack our bags and grab a coffee and are chit chatting and getting in the hot tub to just shake off the plane. We're not cutting weight. We're just two dudes chilling at a beautiful resort right in Brazil. He's already dead on Tuesday, dead on Wednesday. Every time we went to the hot tub, he was already there on the floor dead, right? There's it like in the locker room, it looks like saw, like it looks like a horror scene. There's just body fluids and, and towels. And it's just, a sh I mean, shame on them. They're very disrespectful to the hotel staff, by the way, they just were really unprofessional. They were unprofessional humans. Just everything they did is fucking knocking shit over and leaving garbage everywhere. And just not caring, like disrupting nice families, trying to have a little vacation because they're the big, tough UFC, like really disrespectful <laughs> humans. Right. Um, so then we go to the fights, we get there, we cut weight, we're ready to go. And it's backstage at the UFC um, venue, wherever it was in, in Brazil. And I get a you know, couple of people like, yo, Charles isn't going to make weight. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, he's over, he's way over. I, I beeline straight up to him, him and his coach. I'm like, hey, coach, what's Charles weigh? He's like, oh, no worries, no worries. We're good, we're good. What does he weigh? I hear he's over. No, no, we're fine, we're fine, we're fine. This back and forth, Charles won't even look at me. I go grab Burt Watson, the coordinator. <laughs> Bert, I tell Bert what's going on. He beelines right over. I want him on the scale. Put him on the scale. He gets on the scale. He's five pounds over. Five pounds over. So then it's like, oh, we'll cut weight. I'm like, I want him fucking cutting weight right now where we're not taking it. I want to see this motherfucker suffer. We got 90 minutes. We're on weight. He's five over. You know how easy it is. That you didn't even fucking suffer, bro. Like we had to to make weight. Fair fight here. So he's pulling up early because he knows Lentz is a beast with nonstop cardio. Cain Velasquez at 145 at that time, just nasty wrestler, right? So anyway, moves forward, he misses weight. He doesn't even try and cut, they pretend he's never wet, he's just like hiding in the back, pretending he's trying to cut, pretending the weight doesn't come off, whatever. Doesn't even show up to fight the next day. 
like big shit show. So I, I say this only to show you Charles Oliveira and his team are very unprofessional. Five times he missed weight. What happened on this, this scale? Charles mentally breaks. He probably did overeat, if that is true. Now, the UFC has three scales the athletes can use during fight week. These are test scales. They're digital test scales. They're very expensive test scales. Hmm. You test, we as professionals bring our scale, compare it to the test scales. I compare it to all three. I get on, get off, get on, get off, get on, get off, get on, get on, get on mine and off, off, confirm, confirm, confirm. I know exactly. So our scale is now the official scale for us. And I still go back and recalibrate every single day because we're professionals, right? We're doing what we do. So as, as you go through, you'll, you'll know if you're on weight or not, you're up at nine o'clock in the morning. You have to be there at nine o'clock in the morning. You walk in, the UFC then puts you on the test scale. This is an hour before the, the live scale opens and you have access to the real scale now full time. Step on the test scale, you know, and the commission knows, everyone knows, the UFC expediters know how close it is. Usually they make the test scales heavier than the real scale. Usually it's about a half a pound half, because they want yeah. everyone to make weight, right? So right. it's a benefit. I never say that to my athlete, but I understand it. Everyone's always a half a pound under or so. Why is that? Well, that's a good thing. So to, to wrap all this up, Charles stood on the scale. He was over. I believe he mentally broke. He intentionally tries to stack the deck. He's spooked by his opponent. He's trying to gain a perceived advantage of extra weight because he, he won't go through what's necessary to actually make weight and be a professional. And then he had two hours to lose. What was it? A pound or two, two hours to lose. Yeah. Something that weight. any reasonable person could lose without question, unless you're at the brink of death and you need to go to the hospital and that you shouldn't be fighting anyway. And so Agreed. I'm just like, I don't believe what's happening. No, you're spot on. It's bullshit and shame on him. And he's just one athlete of the year. How do you win athlete of the year when you lost your title for missing weight on the scale? Yeah. That makes no sense. It's a, it's a far. So, Fan of his athletic ability in the octagon. I don't take anything away from him there. I, you know, he's, he's a great fighter physically. I, I respect that. What he is outside of the octagon is very unprofessional. And shame on him for doing that. Five. This is five times. Not one time the pressure got to him. He was a little sick. Five times. And I saw him. One, I saw how dirty they were, how they cheated, how like un, un, dishonest they were to everyone. My, our team, UFC staff. The whole, I want the whole thing. Shame on them for that. So that's my, my little, little rant. Yeah. Really interested that, that, that clears things up for me. Cause I, I made a video on it and people, anytime I talk about the UFC, people hate it. They hate me talking about it because I'm not a fighter. And so when I say, Hey, as a bodybuilder, I could have made weight. I would have done this. And I'm like, he couldn't have not made weight. you shut up. You don't know what you're talking about. It says you I'm like, just because I don't know how to fight doesn't mean I don't know how to cut weight. And I'm like, I'm telling you that he could have made that weight. If he's within the weight class, he can't just stop sweating suddenly, or he can't go to bed and gain weight overnight. He's like, I went to bed and I was in the weight and I woke up and I was over. I'm like, he either sleep eats or sleep drinks, or he had a burger and thought he would shit it out before he woke up and he's doing it in secret and he doesn't want to admit it. And I'm like, he's human. I'm like, I know how much you suffer to make weight. I've, I've made weight 70 times, but dropping over 20 pounds in 24 hours, suffering to the, like, I'm wishing death. It's the hardest thing you can do. I'm laying in a bathtub one time at Worlds for Powerlifting and my heart rate resting. I'm laying in a bathtub with my face out of the hot water for 45 minutes. My resting heart rate is 154. I'm looking at my heart rate, it's 154. I'm like, I need to get out. And I lost three quarters of a pound. Wow. And I'm like, that's all I lost. That was the last time I tried, like a lot of people will use water saunas to, to cut weight. I'm a hundred percent against it. I then put on, I don't know. I had maybe three jogging pants, three sweaters and a snowsuit. And I sat on a bicycle for 30 minutes and I went up and I lost two pounds. And I'm like, I lost 30 minutes, slowly pedaling a bicycle. And then I walked on a treadmill, like two miles an hour. And I lose two pounds in, an hour, in, in like an hour without even any effort. And I'm like, why aren't everyone doing this? And this is like 22 years ago, I think at this point. And so I stopped cutting weight by doing saunas. And I find cutting weight in the, in water, in hot water is the slowest 
way to lose weight and it's the most draining um and you might not know this guy larry wheels one of the strongest guys in the world yeah yeah. he said he lost 14 pounds in two hours and he had shorts on outside in a jacuzzi and he was laying back and he said he lost 14 pounds in two hours i made a video two or three years ago before i had any popularity and i called him out for it and he blocked me and i've been kind of going back and forth making videos about him he's he seems to do some good stuff now but i've been i'm like this guy's been lying Four, do you think you can lose 14 pounds in two hours laying outside in a jacuzzi? If Unless he's, he's pissing in the shower. He might have gamed the system, filled his bladder, right? Just super salted. His, I've seen guys fudge it like that, almost like a uh, before and after reverse photo. Well, oh, this was dieting. This was um, in because he was saying he didn't use diuretics. And I was saying he used diuretics to make the weight. There's no way you can just cut 14 pounds he had to make 242 for powerlifting and he lost 14 pounds in two hours with a smile on his face no no one can sweat out 14 pounds in a in a sauna bath like it was an outside like it wasn't even a a sauna it was an outside jacuzzi like i have a jacuzzi out right there and i'll lay in it for four hours and i lose one pound it's from going to pee that's it like I was just like, there's no way, but people are like, oh, you're, you don't know what you're talking about, Larry Wheels. And this was back when he could only bench like 520 or something like he's so much stronger now, but I was like, no way did I believe it. So what, what is your opinion on hot water to use as a way to cut weight? Cause I'm just such, I'm just, it doesn't work for me at all. What do you think of that? And what do you think about me saying like wearing a snowsuit and doing like easy cardio while wearing several layers of clothing? So we look for the most passive way to lose the maximum amount of weight. Now, hopefully you're trying to lose less than six pounds on average and a small percentage of your total body weight. Hopefully 2%, 4% really maximum is what we're trying to lose during the acute dehydration phase again. Okay. So you're talking about the last part, like you've already cut, you've already dieted, say it was three months out. You've lost the body fat and you've done the peak week part where you cut the water and you're losing all the water without doing the sweating. Cause I like save the sweating for the last minute as well. So I've already lost. So I'll be like 220 and I'll start sweating at say I'm 202. And then I want to get down to 198 and I lose the first like 18 pounds by not drinking any fluids doing whatever. Yep. So similarly, so we'll, we'll go through and we really start to focus on the, the peak week, the wake cut about 21 days out. We really get hyper-focused on food timing and meal size. We're looking for digestive clearing, right? We want to make sure the food we're eating is very efficiently passing right through. Um, we're, we're monitoring, we're, we're maintaining balance of our fluid intake. Let's say it's six liters per day for the individual athlete. We're, we're, now we're fixed at fluid intake. I want to remove as many variables as possible. So it becomes easier to make smaller adjustments. Once we get to about 10 days out or so, we start to play with sodium levels and we want to start passively practicing weight loss. And what I have my athletes do is I say at night before bed, take a 30 minute hot tub or hot bath. I want you drinking water or chamomile tea. I want the lights off. I want it to be a very relaxing situation. So we're we're associating this relaxed state with perspiration, with the release of water, because weight cutting itself is more of a stress-inducing state. So now I'm practicing a stress-relieving state that we're making the association, which we found to be much more efficient when the acute weight loss actually kicks in, you know, 12 hours, 36, three hours before, you know, we step on the scale. So we start that. And also after the bath, nice, easy, chill bath, take a cold shower, take a warm shower, turn it to cold, slowly finish your night with the anti-inflammatory benefit of finishing cold, reset the metabolism, by the way, and you fall asleep so well. So it's very restorative and relaxing, but we're teaching the body how to cut weight, how to release more water. And we found over time, you know, keeping, you know, data here that the individual actually starts losing more water per 10 minute interval as they get more proficient at losing water. So now we go through and what we do, Greg, is we reverse taper. Let's say we're drinking six liters per day. We start to peak sodium. We lift sodium artificially day 10, nine, eight, seven. And on day five, we drop sodium back to baseline 
So we don't have to fully sodium deplete because the athlete's still training. They're still, they still have to work. Their heart needs to function. So we, we don't drop sodium. We artificially raise and then go back to baseline. We've kept water at a baseline um, until day five. And then we start to increase. I call it a reverse pyramid. Six liters goes to, and I say 6.1, one unit of, maybe for you it's 16 ounces. Maybe me, it's 32 ounces. So six plus one, plus two, plus three. So I go from six liters to six and a half to seven to seven and a half to an eight. So we'll peak all the way to Wednesday before Friday weigh-in. Wednesday is peak water day. Let's say it's, it's eight liters. The day before weigh-ins, we actually drink half of that before noon. So we'll drink four liters by noon, which is now an even greater expedited pace of hydration creating the water release mechanism of the body. So the body's like, this asshole every day has increased water. Now he's even on a higher pace today, fucking gallon before noon, it kicks it in. And that's where we, similar to you, cut it off. So it, it's just under 24 hours. We cut it at noon, weigh-ins are at nine the next day, but we have until 11, so close enough. We cut it. What I like to do is maybe drop a little bit of, of espresso into the athlete. It helps offset the appetite. We're not really, I'll, I'll talk about food if you want to also. You increase caffeine intake to help with the, the decrease, uh, like, well, it help you pee more a little bit and give you a bit of energy. Plus you're not eating all that food. Exactly. And, and you like, get them to eat like uh, fats and proteins, or do you just cut out carbs? You have dry carbs. Are you carb depleting them at all or, or completely or not at all? Great question. We don't carb deplete. We switch from more complex to more simple. And it, I say it, it's strategic carbohydrate infusion. I want to give them just enough and it's fruit based. So you have all the benefits of eating fruit. You still have the fiber. We're probably the only high fiber minded weight management system in combat sports. Everyone, they pull fiber, they pull carbs, they pull sodium. They go hardcore keto five to 10 days out. Athletes are damn near dead. They typically go like yeah. spilled water. They're damn near dead come Monday of fight week. It's so silly, by the way, and ineffective because you see so many failures. But we go more simple sugar. We'll still do like the oats in the morning. You know, we'll, we'll still do something complex. Oats, we, you know, a lot of good fiber. We have some of those, you know, 20, 30 grams of, of carbohydrate from the oats. We'll do some seeds in there. Again, high fiber based, but fruit. Four servings of fruit every single day, all the way through. And then even like cold pressed beet juice, if they got to do like interviews or media day, you know, it depends on how close they are. And also I talk about digestive clearing. I want to pull a good one, two, three pounds from the digestive system that may have otherwise been inside you on the scale. So we don't have to deplete that. But also the inflammatory response of pushing certain foods through the digestive system. There's a, a, a systemic inflammation that will go to you, you, the bags under your eyes due to an inflammatory digestive system, an inflammatory environment. So we're really looking to manage that, which is, I say, 21 days. We really want to get focused, find the, the most efficiently absorbing foods. Everything's easy, nice, flat tummy, perfect bowel movements, like trying to lock that in. And that just becomes Groundhog Day. So then as we go through now, the body is dry and lean as we get into that cutting off the water on Thursday at noon. So we do 50% of the highest day. We cut it off by noon and then we, we chill. We like, I like, I like to, let's go, let's go for a walk around the, the park or let's, you know, go to the movie. Let's walk through downtown. Like I love to like take the athlete mind out of it. Let's go grab a coffee somewhere. Let's go people watch fucking get an espresso and just be normal people, right? Be normal humans but we're still active, neat. I know you talk about neat also. Non-exercise, we say associated thermogenesis. Getting up and moving, we're going for a walk. Our core temperature's up. Armpits are sweaty, crotch is sweaty, right? We're, we're, we're losing weight actively. Hopefully, if there's anything left in the digestive system, that extra movement will keep the metabolic effect going. The little bit of espresso, caffeine will help glide the rest of that out. Yeah. So- that's the way we enter it. Now at this point, then it becomes, all right, dehydration stage. We typically will do our first soft cut, which is in the hot tub about 4 p.m., let's say. And we only do 45 minutes max. And we have what we call the, the Dolce step method in which we get into the tub. We stay immersed 
for five minutes because it's heat sensors. We immerse all heat sensors for five minutes. Then we sit up to chest level where the armpits come out for five minutes. Then we set up to waist level. So the hands come out now for five minutes. And then we get into the cold plunge. If we can reset the metabolism, bring core temperature all the way down because you want to get back in the heat and your body gives up so much more water after being cold. It starts from zero again, where if you stay hot, and a lot of athletes you'll see in the UFC, they go from the hot tub to the plastic suit with blow dryers on it, right back to the hot tub. The amount of sweat they lose starts to taper dramatically because all the stress hormones are being kicked out. We wipe the slate clean. There is no more stress here. There's no heat stress. And then, sorry, I mean, I'm talking long just to give you the process. And then, so we'll lose easily in that 45 minutes, the average size athlete will usually lose a pound every 10 minutes. So wow, that's good. Yeah. Right? That's way more than I lost. But I also like how you mentioned getting cold again. Cause when I, even when I do it with the sweating, like in the, with the clothes, like, so basically we're doing it the same way ish is just using water versus I'm using a lot of warm clothes, but I also will go in that cold shower. And you need to reset yourself after a while. It just becomes too much. You need to relax yourself and, and you don't want to lose it all. And like people try to rush it. It's like, you just got to take your time, lose some sweat, shower it up, then go back to it when you reset, when your heart rate, resting heart rate gets back down to normal, because you don't want to like overstress your body too quickly. It just becomes too much. You're right. And what's the rush? If you've done it properly, there should only be a couple pounds left, like single digit percentage of your total body weight at the very end. If you've done the training camp, if you've done the whole off season, we say the 52 week weight cut. If you're a professional, you're Tom Brady. You got to think like that. It's 52 mm -hmm. weeks out of the year. Weight cuts coming no matter as soon as your last fight, Bernard Hopkins, great quote. He just beat, won the world title, defended it for a record time, middleweight world champion, defended it for a record time. He's leaving the casino and the undercard guy comes in who just had the biggest fight of his career. He's all drunk partying, you know, hop, you know, come over here, come over here, you know, come party with us. And hops like, I got another guy to fight. You know, something along like I'm getting ready. He said, once I step out of the, the ring, I'm already preparing for my next opponent. And he just like, that's the mentality of, of that type of athlete, the Tom Brady, the, the LeBron James, let's say At, mixed martial arts athletes. I don't know about bodybuilders, MMA athletes. They don't have that. Patty Pimblet, boom, massive, massive weight gain in the off season. It makes it horrible, which makes these weight cuts really hard. And then it becomes extreme and damaging, which I hate to see that. I want it to be so methodical. So, so boring in many ways, boring and healthy is, is the way to go with this stuff. And it's easy to do with a little bit of, of discipline. And a lot of athletes lack that. So my question is, do you get mostly people who are on point, like the healthy people that can do your diet or are the most of the people like they don't listen to you. You've, you've given them their diet and they've cheated on their diet and they end up having to cut 20 pounds in two days because that's what I get. I'm, I'm turning pro in the week. Uh, uh, I didn't listen to my coach and what's your tricks. I, so I'm coaching people in secret behind other coaches backs to tell them what to do, to try to get pro cards. Literally it's happened multiple times in the last several years. And I'm like, okay, you need to do this and this, and this is a trick. Cause my tricks are usually the best for like, you have the most amount of weight to lose and you need to get shredded. Like this is going to work. But like, it sounded like your method was great but the people had to like be able to stick to the diet and eat the cleansing foods, like not have the cheat meal. So what do you do when somebody is like, they screwed up, they didn't follow your diet. They're hungry. They can't stick to the diet or like they're, they have to lose too much weight. Like, what do you do then? I, I have great examples. It's funny that you mentioned you're coaching behind other coaches. One of the big fighters on this last weekend's UFC card called me on Tuesday because the weight cut was off the rails and they, they needed that help and support. And it, it, it did seem legitimately off the rails, unfortunately, but we'll think about an athlete like Johnny Hendricks. So I work with Johnny Hendricks for his, his title reign when he ran through the division, knocking out John Fitch was my first fight with Johnny he knocks out John Fitch and um, Carlos or Martin Campman beats Carlos Condit in a freaking war. Uh, Josh Koscheck, like he, he makes the run goes all the way through. And then we beat Robbie Lawler for the world title. Johnny Hendricks was one of the worst, weight cutting athletes in the history of MMA, but also collegiate wrestling, where he was a two-time NCAA division one national champion. 
I mean, there's stories I, you know, spent time with, with Coach Smith, Smith, John Smith, one of the greatest American wrestlers of all time, right? And he's the coach of OSU. And I spent time with Coach Smith and he was like, man, I don't know how you do it. He's like, we would have coaches posted at all the local McDonald's the night before big matches because we knew Johnny would show up and Johnny showed up and they would tell stories about ripping Johnny out of a McDonald's at 11 o'clock at night, the night before a big weigh in when he was over. And Johnny would say, man, he, he, he didn't, I, I love the, I really love Johnny Hendricks as a human being, right? So I'm not talking, I'm speaking lovingly about this. He would say, Hey, listen, if a quarter pounder weighs, you know, 0.85 ounces, he was like a savant with the math when he calculated <laughs> food weight. He's like, if it only weighs a pound, then I can, I can cut a pound and, and eat that burger. I was like, Johnny, it doesn't work like that, man. Like it does, but he, there's a cataclysmic effect of that food choice. There's better options if we're going to do that. He never got that Sonic Burger and like all this stuff. They called him the Baconator. That was his nickname, right? That's the name of like Sonic's most famous burger anyway. Um, his sweet tea guy. But to get an athlete like Johnny on weight, number one is they have to trust me. Like he had to trust me, his family, his coaching team. And, and fortunately, they saw me with Vitor Belfort, what I did with Vitor, who was massive. And I, you know, won't bore you with all those stories about Vitor, which is incredible. They saw me behind stage with Vitor, get him on weight. He was massive for 185. They saw him 22 pounds over the day before with me yoked and shredded and then 186 the next day. And they were like, fuck, they called me. So I flew out there, spent time with him and I saw the way he lived and it was an education practice. I knew it was going to take time. It was, I would have to educate them on nutrition science and performance. And the only way I could do that was teach them how it feels to feel better. Right. So it was the athletes, they'll like fly me in as part of my deal was you, you bring me in for three days. I got to breathe your air. Let's make sure we get along at the higher level. Anyway, I consult whatnot, but at the higher level, we got to make sure we get along. Like, I won't even charge you for that. You fly me out, take care of me. Like, do we get along? Are you going to listen to me? Are you coachable? Like who's around you? What do you see? I need to know this to be a better coach to program properly. And did that with Johnny. All right, this is going to work. Here's the education. And he was open to it. And he was pretty good until he got really successful. And then he started to have too much faith in me where he took me for granted and would be like, he'd fuck up. He'd be like, coach, he's like, I know you'll fix it. Like, I know you'll fix. It. I'm like, Johnny, that's not the fucking point, man. I shouldn't have to fix this. Like, these are you're making little kid mistakes here on purpose. Little temper tantrums. You're eating bad food. Yeah. OK, you're a multimillionaire. I don't give a fuck. Like, I would rather work with the undercard kid who literally can't even afford to pay me. I'd rather work with that kid, fly myself out because that dude is going to listen. So like you, that's and towards the end of my career. I stopped working with blue chip athletes. I really only worked with people. I was I was emotionally on the journey with at, at that level, right? It wasn't about the paycheck anymore, but with a lot of these athletes, man, they had to buy in. And usually Tiago Alves, they bought in because they're like, usually on our program, it we're food first. I want you eating a lot of food. We don't cut calories in the beginning. We increase calories because most athletes are nutrient deficient and fuck. They feel better. Then we start to tweak. Then they're like, damn, I can't eat all this food. Okay, good. Now we start to scale back and taper and we find the rhythm. Multi, you know, I'm, I'm a multi meal. I'm not a, a fasting guy, right? Four five, six meals a day and pre and post tra I don't care what you call it snacks or pre-workout or meal one call. It's, you need to eat at this fucking time. You need to ingest, you know, whatever, whatever it is. So we build that out. And that helped a lot of the athletes because they were so used to dying and suffering, eating handfuls of spinach and protein powder mixed in distilled water, which was very common in like the early 2000s, you know, 05 to like 2010. It was old school Joe Weeder bodybuilding style influence in weight cutting that I came in with this completely different approach, right? From the blend of amateur wrestling and powerlifting with a passion for food and, and some undergrad work in clinical nutrition. And I mentored under an amazing RDA or RD who was a high level bodybuilder. So I had this different look to it, but also I think what helped and probably helps you is I was a competitor. I was also on the mats every day. So the guys I was coaching, I wasn't as good of an athlete, but I was in better fucking shape. And I was typically stronger and had better endurance. Like I was elite when it came to my physical abilities. I just didn't have the timing or the length or the flexibility. I didn't have the reaction time. Let's say, you know, my feet and hands don't quite move like a George St. Pierre, God forbid. 
but I could be on the track with him and in the gym with him all fucking day long. And like, let's go. Who's, who's got one more. I'm still I'm ready to go. Like I'm, I'm that guy, you know, for whatever that's worth. So I would get a lot of the respect of the athlete in that, like training with rampage Jackson. I was in the gym stronger than him. We're doing deadlifts. I'm yanking out like four or five to coaching it with no belt, no straps. And they're trying, can't even rack pull it. Right. So it's like, you know, in those, and I'm a little guy compared to him. He's just a big man, you know, super strong in his own right. I got like, his, I'm not saying I'm stronger than him just in certain lifts. I was certainly at that level, man, 60 pounds bigger than me. Who's an elite athlete. So getting them to listen was hard. And I think that's where I drew my greatest frustration was you, you know, the treasure map, you know, it, man, dude, you please just do this. Like your whole life will be solved if you simply follow this. And it's awesome, by the way, it's just follow this. And so many people, they get in their own way and I'll finish with this. The great athletes, the greatest of athletes, what makes them so great is also their biggest weakness. It's, it's like Superman, let's say, from Krypton to Earth, and it's kryptonite, that's its weakness. These amazing athletes are Cyclops from the X-Men with the laser eyes, and the laser eyes can kill all the bad guys and destroy Magneto, if you will, but those same laser eyes might just fucking burn down an orphanage. Oopsies, accidentally if it's not perfectly controlled and a lot of these athletes lack the ability to control that aspect of their personality. And usually it burns down parts of their life, interpersonal relationships, business opportunities, right? What makes them so great? You, maybe you even look at a Conor McGregor. He's got a lot of great to him, but there's a lot of parts of his lifestyle that I would not want in my home. I would not I would not be a happy person if I had to live certain aspects of his life, although he's very successful, uber successful in, in another area. So just to, as an example. Yeah, I think what I take from that is that no matter how gifted these people are, they're all humans, like no matter how great they are, they can win every fight, but they can't say no to the cheeseburger on at 11 o'clock at McDonald's. And I think that a lot of people can relate to that. And I think that people forget that these superstar athletes were once like them or they are like them still they think that well this mma fighter he just eats this trains that they say go and he goes but it's not really the case it's more likely that there are going to be a lot of guys like patty paddington or i think that's his name patty where they're probably pimplet where they can't say no to the ice cream where they can't stop eating the cheeseburgers where they just like the food and i think that most people in this world can't eat the perfect diet and they need to have a diet that's realistic and bodybuilders almost all of them we've all had the chicken broccoli and rice and i did it for years and i'm like there's got to be a better way and it sounds like you're the same way you, you you realize that you need to be full you can't just eat only spinach and protein powder. It has to be something that you like and enjoy and that you be full and that you can get through the training and the dieting. Cause it's not easy to get down to whatever percent body fat an MMA fighter has to get to, to make the weight class, to do all these things. It's hard. And so you have to have balance and that no matter how talented you are, you're just a normal human. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And, and I agree with you. Also what set us apart to a degree is we found culturally appealing food combinations when i would when i would go to the athlete's house and say all right what do you normally eat like what do you eat on your birthday what do you eat on holiday what do you eat on christmas what did your mom used to make when you were a kid what was your favorite meal growing up and i learned that and that's kind of how we came out with our living lean cookbook which is reverse engineering culturally enjoyable foods with an athlete's mindset it's just, I mean, it's so easy. It's, it's just, it's all macros effectively. So we use more micronutrient dense macronutrient relevant foods at the proper serving calorically. Right. So how easy is that? But it's like, you know, slightly sloppy mics, we call it, which is a, a, a twist on sloppy Joe's or mom's meatloaf yeah. in a pinch. Like you can be a bodybuilder, a fighter and have fucking meatloaf and mashed potatoes, just, you know, a, a white potato that that's, mashed up with a little greek butter or grass-fed butter with salt and pepper on it now you can you can have a you don't have to have a boiled boring fucking potato like you can turn that into an air fry or french fry if you want to right so it's like coming up with these foods because most people are too lazy to come up with these recipes for themselves of a healthier way to do it so coming up with that but to your point the athlete has to feel fully emotionally satisfied and that's something else to focus on is 
many coaches and many systems, they overlook the emotional component of competitive sports and training and all the lifestyle stress that is on the peripheral. You still got a wife or a girlfriend. You still got kids. Maybe you still got IRS up your ass. You still got the fucking transmission or the water heater. You still got the annoying neighbor. You still have all that stuff. While then, and most people use food as a coping mechanism for that stuff. So you as a competitive athlete, you can't. The food can become a punishment. And some people do like flog themselves with the chicken and the broccoli because that's the way, you know, my daddy done did it. And they kind of go through life with that mentality, which that's the disorder. Um, so it's interesting to see. How you know it's funny to see we have a lot of similarities. I knew we did, you know, there's lots of similarities. I, I can, you know, see that and it, it's fun to just watch what you do, of course, you know, professionally on YouTube and such. But when you start to peel back and drill through the science, what you're doing is very similar to what we do, which is just preaching the known laws of nature. Like you and I, we're, we're not fucking inventing gravity here, but we're, we're pointing to the ball that keeps dropping. It hits the ground. Every time I drop the ball, it hits the fucking ground, right? So that's all we're doing is showing everybody out there in our own little twist, right? We have different vantage points and different lenses, as they say. But it's all basically the same, eating high net nutrient foods that are enjoyable, but in a ratio that matches your goals, physique goals, aesthetic goals, lifestyle goals. We all get to certain points. Then it's just about living better, Right. Hopefully I have abs, but I want to make sure my fucking heart is working more important than me having abs at 46 years old is I want a, a clean fucking cardiovascular bill. Yeah, I think that we think exactly the same. And what we've done is dumbed down what's actually really simple in the first place, made it really simple. And people look at it and say, it can't be that simple. And it's like, no, it is. It's just like the simple recipes that are lowering calories that keep you full, that have the micronutrients that you need. You, you eat that, you feel good, you lose the weight. It's really that simple, but people don't realize it's that simple. They don't know that it it's there's certain calories in certain foods, calories in, calories out. And I know we discussed that, but really we, we're on the same page with that. It just we're just discussing in a different way. And so if you keep it simple, people realize if they eat this cheesecake, this cheeseburger, the calories in it, switch it to something else, you can lose weight, keep it simple. Everyone can do it. Yep. Now, for those listening, you are a master of building muscle. I mean, right now you're fucking in great shape still. You've had your competitive career. That was, you know, quite a few years ago. You're maintaining awesome shape. You've done it naturally. You've done it assisted. You've done it as a bodybuilder, as a power lifter and an endurance athlete. That's a lot of experience. So you actually, you wear a lot of hats here and, and respect to you for that. For the average person listening right now, how would you suggest they best spend their time? They have 60 to 90 minutes per day to exercise. What are your go-tos? Like I don't top five or whatever. I don't care what it is. What are your go-tos for that person trying to maximize benefit and minimize that time investment that most people make that excuse. I say they don't prioritize time to be healthy, but they want to be healthy. What would you say? These are the must do's. I think that in saying the first thing is, is that most people don't have that 60 to 90 minutes. I think that if people could invest 60 to 90 minutes a day, they would all be, that would be the dream client that could do that. I think you have to look more at like, do you have three days a week that you can put in 60 minutes and then maybe you can put in 20 minutes in the other days? And if so, then that's still enough. I think doing a full body workout two to three days a week, as far as weights goes, is plenty. I think that's all you need to do. And then I think that just going for regular walks on other days is enough. I think that if everyone did that, I think 90% of people would be more than happy with their physiques. I think that would solve 90% of the problems. I think that what people get stuck up on is that they need to be perfect in every way. And honestly, if you do what I just said, you're going to get 80% of the results as the pro bodybuilder training seven days a week for two hours. Three days a week, full body. I train with weights three days a week. That's it. I do full body and I do cardio on the other days. That's it. I'm on top of the full body. I'll usually ride like 30 minutes on, you know, I'll be in the gym for an hour and a half to two hours, maybe three times a week. And then on the other days, usually an hour, but I'm trying to race as a bike rider. So if you take the bike racing out, I only have to train three days a week with weights 
and and just do a little bit of cardio on the side and that's all you need so all you to do just you know pick an exercise that you enjoy that you like for each body part do it two to three days a week and then just do cardio that's all you need i think that people overcomplicate and want to do too much and the the difference from that to the other that's you know, what I just said will give you 80% of the results you're going to get. And then the other 20%, that's all the little details that we all battle out on. How many sets, reps, time under tension? What do you, this, that, how much cardio before it? All that stuff is that minor 20%. But if you can focus on the 80%, the rest is just icing on the cake. Yeah, I agree, man. Spot on that, that full body every other day is the way to go for the average person. Maybe uh, uh, eventually you want to be in the gym. I like to be in the gym a little more often. I find a therapeutic effect to that. I like the activity and I have built it into my day, right? So it's just a normal part of my routine, which is awesome right now. Um, I'm, I like to do like a, a push pull leg style, very similar to full body, just slightly segmenting it or push pull press legs when I'm really trying to be a meathead and just, you know, spend a little extra time on, on a main core lift, like for each level of motion. But my default has always been full body every other day, every third day, sometimes with yeah. a lot of movement. And I try and be super active. Like you're saying, we talk about going lists. Fasted list is, is one of our go-tos. It's a great way to start the day for a lot of people. It sets the tone with the win early on. It gets the body moving, right? It's low intensity. So it's, it's, we're not, we're making. Yeah. No you're not race. racing on a, on a bike race. Like, and for me, no. I'm only doing like push pull legs. You just described. That's great. That's what I was doing before. Then I kind of got into the half my body one day, half the other, and just kept repeating. But like yeah. my main focus is to win bike races right now. And so the weightlifting is kind of second secondary. So I'm only training with weights like that because that's the time I have. If I lift more weights, that's less time I can bike ride and I can't train my legs as hard. Like I can't do set after set of legs because like today I'm doing a bike race. Yesterday I did my full body and I did 30 minutes of cardio on the bike. Today I've got to do a bike race. So it's like, I can't train every single day. So that's just why I'm doing what I'm doing now. Yeah. And that bike race, that's hard work. Oh, it's right. flat out. It's a race to, to win. And, and I'll lose by 0.2 of a second or win by 0.1. So it's like, I'll take every supplement I can take to be at my best because one second is the difference between first and 10th. Have you found any supplements to be truly beneficial? Oh, there's tons. I mean, I could make a whole video on, on just supplements, but like uh, creatine, I'll name some that people don't really know much about or beta alanine, probably the most underrated supplement that I would make every UFC guy take. It's it helps buffer lactic acid and exercise around a minute or longer using the anaerobic a lactic or sorry, the anaerobic lactic energy system. Not like the sprint for 10 seconds, but the second one, not the aerobic energy system, but like kind of in the middle there um, that can really help you have a huge difference. Like you could go a couple seconds faster a couple you can just put in that work like you're almost ready to tap out and you just have that extra oomph to go it prevents that lactic acid from from forming also mnm it's in my i have a supplement it's called geo2 max nmn dramatically improves your ability to perform cardio and so like if you're a cardiovascular athlete and you're not taking these things you're certainly losing out i've given it to some like guys who are cyclists, like not cyclists on stairs, it's actual bike cyclists, like ah. racers. And, and they're like setting PRs. It makes such a big difference. And then we have all the ectosteroids, which there's, it's a lot of controversy right now because is it terkestrone that's working or not? Is There's ectosteroids in general that all seem to work uh, to an extent. Um, there's human trials that have been shown to that show this to work problem is there's not 500 there isn't a thousand the way creatine is and it takes years to get these things done and one study isn't enough to really say anything works or doesn't work but certainly these are beneficial supplements and l-citrulline for example another great supplement but aside from like creatine and caffeine these things are just icing on the cake it's not like you need to take them it's just like when you're an athlete like myself and you want to win, or if you're a fighter and you're like, the difference between winning and losing is 1%, that's like, you're going to take it. It's just, that's the way it is. That's a good point. Most people don't realize that that becomes the, the cherry on top, if you will. 
It's something you scale to through time and consistency and dedication and, and laying down the basics. Most people don't need any of those supplements, but those are highly effective supplements at the top level when you notice it. You're going to notice that when you're at that level, you're in the top three in your category. You don't notice it if you've never done a race before. It doesn't even yeah, matter. The, <laughs> the right? average person is not going to notice when they take beta alanine or, or creatine or these things. And it's like, yeah, but when I'm putting out 300 watts and if I would have done 305, I would have won yeah. for that hour. It's like, how would I not take it? But if you're yeah. just the average going for a, a jog outside for 20 minutes, like who cares? Don't take it then. Yeah, it's funny. We in 2016, we worked with Galen Rupp, who ran in the marathon for the United States in the Olympics over in England. So he was running out of the Oregon project in you know, for Nike in, in you know, in Oregon. Um, they brought us in to do the nutrition alongside their training. It was crazy how much they, they had more metrics than the Olympic Training Center. They analyzed everything. So it was really cool to see this data on this type of athlete. But to your point of like that slow margin or small margin of error. The goal was to shave off five seconds per mile of his marathon time. Five seconds per mile over 26.2 miles would take him from not placing to the podium. And you think about the average person right now here, we have to shave off five seconds of your max mile time, right? Most people don't even know what a mile time That's is. That's training for two days. They right? would, you know what I mean? Like, but for uh, you're a top level, that could be a year. Yeah. And, and for him, it was like reclaiming his best ever time. That was like three years ago, trying to reclaim that. And you, you'd appreciate this. One of the goals was to reduce his total body weight by 3%. That would more to- than do what you just needed. The, 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 the five second time, it only need about one and a half pounds of body weight loss to equal that with the same power. Just made based on the on the watts. I don't know if they calculated watts or they did, but to your point, also the time to be running for that long. So it was not just the, the top speed, but the top speed maintained over time and the amount of heat his body would be generating, right? And also they were taking in like even the way they were able to alter his body of slightly slimming his upper body and shoulders and putting more in his hamstrings and calves. So it was more aerodynamic and more of the muscles where you want them to be like a cyclist look at me on a bike like i'm not aerodynamic but if you have huge quads like that i forget that bike rider who's got like 30 plus inch legs he sprints his upper body is really small but his legs are massive so all the power is going where it needs to be you don't need big arms to ride in a time trial yeah. Now, would you say if so? Do you do your racing on the interactive bike in your Inter- house? Yeah, online. So it, it just uses your height and your weight, and it has a coefficient. So it doesn't really apply in the real world. In the real world, well, I probably wouldn't be as fast because my shoulders would be too wide. I wouldn't be like. I mean, I can't even like some guys are stick figures here and they can cut through the wind better. And and how aerodynamic are you would matter your bike, but it's just for fun. Like I'm racing for fun. It's not like real. I'm not like it's for fun. I enjoy it. It gives me dopamine. It makes me fit. It makes me have, give me a reason to wake up in the morning. That's awesome. Where a lot of people, they struggle. They struggle to find something that makes them happy, that gets them out of bed in the morning, that makes them feel like themselves, right? Invigorates them. Most people tend to abuse themselves with food, with, with alcohol, with cigarettes, with recreational drugs. That's most common, but you find this other way to suffer in a positive manner, which is that's kind of the only choice that we have as humans. You pick your poison effectively, right? Either suffer on the cycle or go suffer in the bar, you know, poison your liver, or, you know, all, all the other negative effects that come with that. Exactly. Yeah. Well, brother, I really appreciate you, man. O- over two hours here. Thank you so much. Hopefully, you know, we can chat again at some point. I mean, there's so much more that we could go down. We could get so deep in detail. I'd love to hear more on the, the strength training side. I'm always fascinated with, with bodybuilding and also what you've been able to do. That many weight cuts, that many competitions spread over that many different sports. So that'd be a great conversation to have, you know, down the road. Um, but I appreciate your time, man. Big fan of you and what you do, contrary to what everybody thinks. You're putting out great content and consistent 
consistently. I'm in awe of your pace and the work ethic that goes into it. I, I do understand the work ethic behind the scenes of what it must take to do what you do at the pace that you do at the level that you do. It's gangster, brother. Thanks. I just love it. I think that it gives me a reason to live again, just like the bike race, the trade. It's just something fun that I look forward to doing. So if you can make your work fun, then it's not really work. Awesome. And, you know, easy to find you, of course, Greg Doucette, just type your name and you're going to be everywhere. It's not hard for people to find Greg Doucette, of course. Um, is there anywhere that you want them to go most specifically or just to the YouTube channel? No, YouTube is great. Check me out on YouTube, Greg Doucette, and type in whatever topic you want to learn. I've probably done a video on it. How many videos do you have? Uh, 2,100. Wow. And you do what, two a day, typically two to three days? Yeah, two. Some days we'll post three in a day, but like usually 15 videos a week. How many hours do you, do you actively record outside of the research behind it? I would say whatever video you see at the end is never more than 45 minutes of actually recording time. So not that much, but there's a lot more work goes into finding the video to do. Like I'll watch maybe 10 videos before I choose one to react to. And then sometimes I'll watch it a few times to kind of get it in my head. And so the work of actually recording a video, that's the fun part. It's all the other stuff that I don't really like as much. Well, Greg, brother, I really appreciate you being here, man. Thank you so much. I, I really enjoyed the time and the conversation. Uh, very valuable insight. And I look forward to talking again. Yeah, it was great to talk to you. I could see that we think so much alike. It's really interesting to see your opinion. And I learned a lot about the UFC and the cutting and what was going on and the stories. Really enjoyed hearing that. I was kind of on the edge of my seat listening to you talk. So it was exciting for me. Awesome, brother. Well, I appreciate it, man. Let's uh, let's stay in touch. All right, we'll do. Have a Bye. good day. Bye, Greg. Bye, fellas. Bye, bye.